Hello, son and daughters. This Saturday, your old text has some stories that'll make you hoot and holler, and I promise you won't be sleeping easy tonight. So get your lanterns ready, because we're fixing to dive headfirst into the wildest and most hair-raising true horror stories of 2023. So subscribe and hit that like button. Let's go, son. My first experience with Sasquatch was when I was living in Wyoming, Michigan. I was eight years old. It was the last day of school, and I decided to cut across the plowed fields to get home and save about 20 minutes. None of the other kids wanted to come with me, so I headed off towards home. I'd always sing as I walk and not go into any depth. I learned how to mind speak at a very young age. As I was walking, I saw an old red truck facing me sitting to my right out where the two fields met. The wheels were gone, as were all the chrome, windows, and lights. The passenger door was closed, and the driver's door open about halfway. I looked at it and saw no one and walked around the back of it, not looking at it as I passed. He must have been laying in the cab and heard my singing. I got about twenty feet past it and heard in mind speak, What are you doing here? Like you would say if you locked up the dog and then found it sitting on your porch a few hours later. At that point in my life, all I knew was mind speaks with angels, and so I thought you must be friendly, and I turned around. I saw what I thought was a friend of my best friend's brother's. I didn't question why he could mind speak, because I figured everyone could if they wanted to. I started walking toward the truck. He leaned forward out of the driver's door window area as I walked. I asked, what's your name? Then I heard something like the word can. And I heard something like the word Keegan. I walked within a few feet of him, and he leaned out further. He was looking down just a bit, and I was looking up. I would say he was at my ten o'clock. We just stared at each other. His skin was like my mom's kid gloves. It was much thicker looking than mine. He did have freckles and red hair. His nose looked like my brother's, which had been broken so many from so many fights, that even after surgical repair looked flattened and broad. He had finished lips and teeth like ours. His eyes were a golden brown and to me showed expression. I got the distinct impression that he was young, late teens. As we stared at each other, I started asking questions. Please remember, I was only eight years old. I first asked him in mind speak, how come your parents let you grow your hair so long? He didn't answer, but I could see a smile coming across his face. And then I asked, why are you allowed to go to school with a beard? Then, where's your neck? I can't see a neck. And with that, he broke into a smile. As I was going to ask another question, his attention was broken by something to his left. He looked back at me with a word expression and said, Go now. So, with power in the words, I turned and started walking away. I got to the hole in the hedge that separated the field from the street in a four-foot drop and turned around to wave goodbye. He had exited the truck and was standing on the other side of the cab. I was shocked that he was so tall. My dad and grandfather were six foot four inches. He was at least a foot or more taller. He was looking toward my right, but I could not see what was going on from the protection of the hedge. He was flailing his arms, and then he saw me standing there. He said, go now. Don't come back. And I said, you're mean. But I didn't move. All of a sudden, I heard someone screaming and realized it was me. He had sent what I would call a cloud of fear at me, and my body reacted. I turned around. I jumped down the embankment through the hedge and ran down the street to my house. When I got home, I told my mom about what had happened and that he had red hair, and I told her his name was Kenny. She said she would find out who he belonged to. That meant his mom, so she could smack some sense into him. Well, two days later, my mom came home from the store and told me she stopped at both farms attached to the fields. Neither of them had a red-headed son. My mom claimed Chickasaw heritage. She followed native beliefs and told me that Kenny was a forest person living in the woods. I told her he was nice at first, but then told me not to come back. She said if he had told me not to go back, then respect his wishes and do not go back there. That was that. Until that point, I believed that he was just one of the boys that hung around with my friend's brothers, and I have to add, he smelled. 
I would have told him he needed a bath. I was shocked about forest people, but I was pissed about not being able to go back to see him again. As years passed, I realized that he wasn't being mean. He was protecting me from whatever was coming from the woods. I got the impression that he was not where he was supposed to be either. Shortly after that, we moved out of the state. This whole thing is like it happened yesterday. I can close my eyes and see him clearly, and it happened in 1957. The fields are all houses now. I haven't heard of this happening to anyone else, but I'm sure it has, and I'm including it so they know they aren't alone. Two stories, both mysteries solved resolution, but both very creepy. Both took place on the California coast south of San Francisco, part of Half Moon Bay for the Californians on here. I'm a paleontologist, and while I was an undergraduate student, I spent a lot of time collecting data, rock samples, and fossils for a series of publications on fossil sharks, fish, birds, and marine mammals. I was at the fossil site, which consists of vertical sea cliffs, with somewhat shitty trails down to the beach, everyone, two miles. I happened to be where the easiest trail down opens up into a bit of a wide canyon that the beach sand fills. Highway 1 is about 200 feet uphill and about 300 feet away from the beach. Very short, and you can see the tops of cars whizzing away. I'm on my lunch break, and fortunately at one of the only places along that six-mile section of coast with cell service. This is 2006, so I've got a shitty Verizon flip phone that had virtually no service except this one spot. On my last visit, I could browse Facebook on my iPhone down there. I see a guy on a bike, far enough away, I can't tell his age. He's riding south toward Santa Cruz. He sees me and stops and stares. I keep eating. He disappears. I look back a minute later and he's about 100 feet down the trail, staring at me. He starts jacking himself off. I immediately pull out my rock hammer and brandish it to show that I'm armed and call the sheriff's department. I tell them I'm going to wait where I am and that they should call me or signal me when they get to my car to escort me back up to the highway. In the meantime, this guy has disappeared. I do not know if he is waiting somewhere for me along the trail, and I do not know if he knows the other trails well enough and if he'll follow me along the beach. I'm also trapped. I cannot go north because the tide is too high. About 40 minutes later, I see a sheriff at the top of the trail wave me up. On the phone, they indicate they caught the guy who claimed he was peeing. We went, found no pee. They warned him and let him go. Some homeless guy, apparently unarmed. This is about a year ago. Same locality. I'm out there with my wife looking for fossils. I've always expected that someday, walking through the detritus that washes up on the shore of the Pacific, that I'm going to find a body or part of one. We're about a mile south of where I met the homeless masturbator, and I see a brown cardboard box sitting against the cliff, and it smells like rotten flesh. Like sweet Jesus, smells like a dead sea lion. The box is also sticky and covered in sand. It measures about eight feet deep and is about a 16 feet wide square. I know that as a scientist and uh, the son of attorney's judges, I need to uh, satisfy my own curiosity and be report anything serious to the authorities. So like any good scientist, I grab a stick and poke it to try and open it. Instead of opening, the whole thing jiggles like a giant slab of jello. My mind went to WTDFN and then immediately realized it was a slab of whale blubber. I've participated in a whale necropsy before, and you remove blubber with a two-person team. One holds a big-ass meat hook, and someone with a Norwegian whaling knife cuts a strip, typically one. Two feet wide, after the incisions are made, the knife holder cuts away at the connective tissue as the hook or pulls a strip of blubber away. The knifer then cuts the strip off into incremental pieces. Turns out this was from a sperm whale necropsy that had taken place about a week before. Mm -hmm. 
I'll never forget that fateful day when two of my friends and I went on a hunting trip in a secluded forest to chase after pheasants. Little did we know that this adventure would lead me to an encounter that defied all explanation and left me feeling both perplexed and mocked. As we set out on our hunt, we soon separated to cover more ground. I went on my own path, following the faint smell of something rotten that lingered in the air. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to follow the odor, wondering if there might be a carcass nearby. As I ventured deeper into the woods, the forest grew darker, and an uneasy feeling settled over me. The smell grew stronger, leading me towards a clearing where the sun barely penetrated the dense canopy of trees. It was in that dim light that I saw it, a creature unlike anything I had ever encountered. The creature had a humanoid-shaped head with jet-black soulless eyes staring back at me. Its back was hunched, and its mouth stretched open as if it were screaming in eternal agony. My heart raced as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. The creature appeared pale and sickly, almost anorexic in appearance, and its movements were unnatural and unsettling. As I observed it from a distance, it suddenly moved with incredible speed, almost as if it were gliding. Its leg joints were inverted and bent in the opposite direction, making its movement seem otherworldly and disturbing. Fear and adrenaline surged through my veins as I instinctively raised my rifle, aiming directly at the bizarre creature. My hands trembled as I pulled the trigger, the loud gunshot shattering the eerie silence of the forest. But to my disbelief, the bullet passed right through the creature, as if it were a ghost. The creature didn't react at all. It merely vanished into the darkness of the forest, leaving me puzzled and bewildered. When my friends eventually returned to the spot where we had agreed to meet, I couldn't contain myself. I eagerly recounted the bizarre encounter I had just experienced. I expected them to be as astonished and concerned as I was, but instead they burst into laughter, thinking I was playing some kind of practical joke. Their mocking made my frustration grow, and I couldn't understand why they didn't take me seriously. I knew what I saw, and it was no joke. But without any evidence to back up my story, I couldn't blame them entirely for their skepticism. As we continued our hunt and eventually returned home, the memory of that strange creature haunted my thoughts. I questioned my own sanity, wondering if the isolation and excitement of the hunt had conjured up some hallucination. But deep down, I knew what I saw was real. I may never find an explanation for that encounter in the secluded forest, and my friends might continue to laugh it off. It's a tall tale, but one thing's for sure. I'll forever remain intrigued by the unknown and the mysteries that lie hidden in the darkness of those woods. When I was a kid through my older teen years, I used to get what I called night fright. So my parents' house is in the middle of nowhere. They own 13 acres themselves, and they do have neighbors. But usually you only hear gunshot, maybe yelps woo. You sometimes hear your neighbors, but rarely see them. So when I would stay at home alone, I'd hear music or talking. Music I didn't recognize, or voices I didn't recognize. I'd walk outside to see if I could find out who was playing polka music, which I did hear a couple times, but no music outside. I'd keep the dogs inside with me, lock the doors, and sit and watch TV. Then once my parents would come back, I'd tell them about it. They never heard it until after I'd moved out. My dad thought I'd imagined it. One summer night, he heard polka music in the house, never outside. I'd always decided it was my imagination. I never figured out who it was, but I sometimes heard it when no one lived in those houses, and never outside. This is actually something my dad experienced, and he told this story many times throughout my childhood because it's always perplexed him. Growing up, my dad loved to go camping with his friends. When he was about six, his parents let him stay in a shed with his friend in the friend's backyard overnight. They woke up to a pin-sized light zipping around the wall above them in the middle of the night. 
It was white, but about the size of a laser pointer. This was in the early 60s. They both got up and the light stopped on the center of the wall. The shed was steel. They put their hands over it and it disappeared. As they pulled away, it didn't reflect onto them. It suddenly jumped over to the other wall and the same phenomenon occurred. They opened the door and walked around the shed. Neither could find anything causing this light. They went back in, but as soon as they laid down, the light started zipping around again. They finally went into the house to sleep. They slept in the shed a few months later and nothing happened. They never had an explanation for the light. So it was a year ago I was living in El Peso near Fort Bliss because my dad was in the army. I had gone to New Mexico to visit an old girlfriend and was driving home. Now if you're around this location, you know how long of empty stretches there are with only mountains around you. Anyway, I'm driving back in my father's old Beamer. He bought a new truck for himself and gifted me the old and reliable car. Now as I'm driving, I watch a nice Monte Carlo slow down in front of me and take a right down a dirt path after a pass. Nothing strange at the moment, just that people are going hiking or something in the middle of the night. It was late, going on one in the morning. As I'm driving, the car breaks down, so I have to pull over. Pissed, I get out and check the engine, seeing if I can do anything. But it was too dark to get a good look, and I figured it finally died. I pop it in neutral and ride it far off the side of the road and figure I can call for a ride. Of course, no signal in the middle of the desert. So I figure, hell if I have to walk probably six miles to the next town, I'm getting drunk, so I get a bottle of Jack out of my trunk and start walking. Luckily for me, I grabbed it because it was freezing and it made up for my lack of warm clothes. I walk for maybe three miles when a car pulls up next to me. Guess what it was? Yeah, a red Monte Carlo. Inside are two guys, maybe 30 each. One with a ton of tattoos and looks a bit younger, and the other with styled black hair and a gold chain and watch. Had a brief conversation going something like, I, man, was at your beamer up the road driver with gold chain. Yeah, brother, piece of shit broke down. He looks past me kind of what you throw in the ditch when we pulled up. I had throw the bottle thinking it was a cop. Some whiskey. They both laugh and he says, Shit, as you need a ride. I laugh as well saying, Hell yeah. I get the bottle and hop in the back. These two sons of bitches drink their asses off driving me into town and get me plastered. Yet even in my drunken hasteness I didn't fail to realize the tattooed one was sweaty. Like he had been working and was covered in dirt along with something rattling. In the truck while we turned in town. Nothing happened to me except getting wasted in a ride to a near town and getting an Uber home. Yet I still believe that there was a shovel in the trunk and the two men just finished burying someone and were excited to find some alcohol to celebrate with. This took place in October of 2020. Myself, my brother, and my brother's eldest son were gathering the cattle and herding them to the mined homestead, where they could be loaded on trucks and taken to our home ranch for the winter. By this point, the weird activity on the ranch had increased, so much so that we never went to the ranch without being armed. This day was no exception, and strapped to the saddle under my left leg was a Winchester 3030 rifle. The morning went well, and by noon we had gathered 200 head, which we pinned up at the mine place. After eating a quick lunch, my brother and nephew loaded their horses and left. My nephew had a football game later that day. I stayed alone and rode northwest toward the Carter homestead. The first strange thing to happen was when I rode down a canyon. As I was riding, I could hear multiple howls and cries coming from all directions. I cannot describe what these howls sounded like because they were like nothing I had heard before or since. As I continued riding in the canyon, I was overcome with a feeling of dread. My horse, Ace, seemed to pick up on this as well and began spooking at almost every shadow. This was very out of character for him as he was usually a very calm and collected horse. 
The second strange thing was when I approached the Carter homestead. As I crested a hill in front of it, something jumped out of the old log cabin and ran in the opposite direction. I was still close to a mile away, so I had to use my binoculars to get a better look. What I saw through the lenses chilled me to the bone. It was a wolf, but it was massive and solid black. It was so large that it could be mistaken for a black bear, but it was undeniably canine. After seeing the wolf, my gut told me to turn around and come back later with company, but I ultimately continued. Throughout the course of the afternoon, I managed to convince myself that the wolf I saw was nothing more than a coyote, and that its black fur was just a shadow. It was nearing dusk before I arrived back at the mine place, herding thirty head of cattle in front of me. After I pinned the cattle up, I led Ace back to my pickup and horse trailer. From a distance, I could see... There was something wrong with the trailer, and as I approached, I found that the axle had come apart. It didn't make any sense to me, as it was fine when I drove in, and there was no explanation as to what could have made it come apart when it wasn't moving. By this time, it was fairly dark outside, and as we were coming out the next day, I decided to unhook the trailer and leave Ace at the corrals overnight. When I left, I saw three blue lights near the corrals, but I attributed these lights to hunters, so I continued driving. I also heard some more of the howls I had heard earlier in the day. When all three of us arrived the next morning, we found the corrals in a total mess. All the grass was turned up inside the corral, where the cattle had been milling and the fence was broken in several places. The cattle that were pinned up the night before were nowhere to be found, along with Ace. My brother and nephew took off on horseback to try to locate some of the cattle and Ace, but only managed to find around 20 head. As I was without a horse, we repaired the trailer and left later in the afternoon. The next day, all three of us rode, and we searched exclusively for Ace. During this time, I covered a lot of country that I would have otherwise missed, and I discovered more bizarre things. At the bottom of one canyon were hundreds of holes, about one foot in diameter and three foot deep. These holes had to have been dug by people, as there would be no animal that would have dug them. I also found a bone pile, which was exceptionally strange. There were the carcasses of four cows, all piled on top of each other, in an area that they typically would not have access to. At first I thought that this was the act of poachers who were illegally killing and butchering cattle at the ranch, but there would have been no way to get to this location with a pickup or a four-wheeler, for that matter. The more we searched, the less sense everything made. We searched for three days before we came across something. My brother radioed me, as there was no cell service, that he believed he had found Ace. My nephew and I rode to his location, and sure enough, at the bottom of a sinkhole, Sinkholes are very common in this area, so its presence was not unusual, was the carcass of Ace, along with three cows. The sinkhole was at the bottom of a canyon, with the walls of this canyon being 300 feet tall, the sinkhole being another 20 feet deep. It took an hour just to climb down the canyon walls. When I finally approached the sinkhole, I found Ace to be heavily mutilated. Both ears were removed, along with the eyes, nostrils, and hooves. The back half of him was not exposed, but it looked like his tail was also removed. The cows surrounding him also had similar mutilations. As was the case with the howls, the wolf, and the trailer, none of this made sense. It would have been almost impossible for just one cow to end up in this location, let alone three cows and a horse. There were also no tracks leading into or out of the sinkhole or canyon. The sheriff and veterinarian were both notified, and an investigation was launched. The ultimate conclusion was that something had caused the cattle to spook and break out of the corrals, and whatever it was spooked them so bad that they ran all the way from mind, placed to the bottom of the sinkhole, in which they perished. When I mentioned the wolf I'd seen, they were dismissive, just as I had been when the hunters told me of the wolf three years prior. No foul play was suspected, and the case was closed. Though there were many strange things that have happened since then, there were none quite as upsetting as the loss of my horse. Cattle continued to go missing, and we now only ride the place in pairs. 
My brother and I are thinking about terminating the lease as for the moment the current cattle losses are unsustainable. I've always been a big YouTube watcher and found that many stories on the site came from Reddit, so I decided to share mine. Though I don't have any pictures of Ace in the sinkhole, my phone was destroyed in an unrelated incident and I didn't have my files backed up. I do have pictures of a separate bone pile and some of the ranch. Two weeks ago, me and a group of buddies were having a bonfire out in Cuna, Idaho. I was feeling down that night, so I decided to unload my dirt bike and take a little night ride on some trails. I went alone and rode for probably three miles from the fire up on a hill. I sat up there for probably 45 minutes, and I was 100% alone up there. There was nobody around. From time to time, I would hear small laughter really close by. Sounded like two, three people. It wasn't constant. I would hear it every five minutes, and it kept getting closer. I had that funny feeling that I wasn't alone after all. So I went to go start my bike, and of course it didn't want to start. I was able to bump start it going down the hill, and it did not want to stay running. I don't think it sat long enough for the engine temp to drop all the way back down. I had to keep revving it to keep it running, trying to head back to the fire. The whole time I was really scared for no reason. I couldn't convince myself to go faster than five miles per hour, which was strange because I always haul ass. I have a light bar mounted on my bike, so I was able to see just fine. At first riding back, I thought I seen shadow figures in the corner of my eyes, but they would disappear. I made it back safe, and nothing else happened, but I knew there was something out there that night. I didn't think much of it until I heard my buddies talking about skinwalker stories in that same area. People tell me I got extremely lucky that night. I don't know what to believe. Who knows what was out there with me that night? The laughter, my bike not wanting to run, the feeling I had in the shadow figures are all things in common I saw from other stories. It was a strange night. If anyone on here is from Cuna, Idaho, and knows anything about Skinwalker and counters out there, feel free to reach out. My roommate and I were going duck hunting in the UP of Michigan and got turned around in a tag alder swamp on our way to our blind. We walked about a half mile and stopped to check the map and heard a blood-curdling scream yell. He asked what it was, so I told him it was a bird, and when we got to out blind, we loaded our shotguns and didn't say a word to each other until the sun came up. I've spent a lot of time in the woods, and I've heard a lot of strange sounds that could be solved by looking them up, but I couldn't find anything online about it, and none of my hunting friends, young and old, could explain it. It turns out there have been a large amount of Bigfoot sightings in the area, so we determined it was a Squatch. There's an abandoned house in rural North Georgia where my dad lives that you can walk to from his house. All you can see from the road is about seven feet of an indent of what used to be a driveway. It's all overgrown. You have to crawl through woods to get to the house. So I had been in this house a lot. Took a lot of old books, newspapers from the 60s and 70s, letters from whatever war, really cool stuff. In the kitchen, there were also pill bottles with current dates. One time and the last time, I went with a friend. We were crawling through the woods to the front door. I was ahead of my friend, and ahead of me, I hear the creak of the front door opening about five feet in front of me. I turned around, and we goddamn bolted as fast as I've ever bolted. Another time I was driving through Bum F. Mid, Georgia. What, 80? Five used to be before the highway was actually there. About every half hour was a town, maybe one stoplight every 20 miles. So me and an ex were driving through a tiny podunk little town, and I look off to the left at the buildings that were closed. It was the summer, and it was now twilight, so probably like 8 p.m. I see a building that used to be a ranch house, but it had two glass doors in front like a convenience store. 
Through the glass, I saw a woman in an all-white dress robe just standing there in the dark. I followed her as my ex drove the car past, and she never moved, turned her eyes, head, or anything. I still don't know what the hell that was about. Camping at a ghost town in eastern Washington years ago. Friends and I set up camp, got a fire started, and started making dinner. A few hours later, and quite a few drinks, we decided it was best to go explore this place. We heard the typical sounds the woods make at night. Nothing out of the ordinary. We went about a mile from our campsite, and we got this odd, cold chill. Just shrugged it off as it getting colder or the alcohol. We began hearing more, louder sounds coming from the woods. About the same time, we noticed what looked like two red eyes staring at us from about 50 feet away and about 25 feet in a tree. No idea what it was, but it was big. Ran faster than I ever have in my life back to the site with my group. I am from the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. I live in Ashland, about 20 miles from Lame Deer. I have heard stories of the area around the grandmother's home. I have personally been witness to a deerman. It was about 2002 I was hunting on the big divide between Ashland and Lame Deer. I was glassing with my binoculars hoping to find a deer to shoot for one of the elders. I spotted what I thought was a whitetail buck. It was standing in a brush patch about 200 yards in a draw below me. As I was watching the buck through my binoculars, the body started to become clearer. It was a deer head on a muscular man's body. Needless to say, I hurried and got out of the area and didn't go back for quite a while. I have heard many stories of little men, but my only experience with them wasn't a full-fledged sighting. It was in 1997. I was house, sitting for my parents while they were away one weekend. I was sitting in the living room one afternoon watching television when I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. I turned toward the dining room window. I saw what looked like the top of a head popping into view at the base of the window. It looked like someone was jumping up trying to look into the window. I watched whatever it was for a good half a dozen jumps when I rushed over and looked out the window to see who it was. There was no one there. I immediately went outside and looked. I could not see anyone. My parents' house was in a rural area with not many trees or bushes. I should have seen who it was if it was a kid. Whatever it was, I estimated it had to be about three feet tall if it jumped up and only the top of its head showed over the windowsill when it jumped. A close friend also had encounters with a little woman near her house. She would hang laundry in her backyard. Then, when she went back outside to take the laundry down, some of the clothes and sheets were on the ground or missing. This occurred several times until she finally saw the little woman running through the yard at night. She believes that the little people on the reservation are invisible during the day. She described the little woman as being two half feet tall, brown, skinned, and wearing a long, colorful shawl around her. There are a lot of strange sightings and counters on this reservation. I was a witness to El Chupacabra's attacks near Canavanes, Puerto Rico, on two occasions. In the second attack, I caught sight of El Chupacabra's killing a large dog in a field behind my father's workplace. It was after midnight, and I was there helping him get extra work done. We heard the dog growling in the backfield. I went to look and saw a four-foot-tall thing, very ugly, that I had never witnessed before. The dog was keeping its distance from this thing, when suddenly it leaped and attacked the dog. It took only a few seconds as it ripped the dog apart. It never made a sound. I quickly ran into the shop and told my father what I saw. He had a pistol and walked out to see what was there. The only thing that remained was the badly mutilated dog. I was sure it was El Chupacabra's. There was talk of this creature for several days. It looked like a weird man in the distant shadow, but had a lizard head and hairless dog body up close. The large dark eyes were very strange, and it used its teeth and long claws to rip apart the dog. 
I have read recently that many researchers consider this to be a legend, but I will state that it is a completely true creature. Those sightings outside of Puerto Rico and South America, I feel, are bogus and maybe just dogs. When I was around 12, 14 years old, I used to ride my quad literally everywhere. My town was literally on top of a cliff, overlooking the river, next to a decent amount of woods. These woods were filled with Native American artifacts. It wasn't well known in fear that an archaeological group museum would come in and clear the land for anything that was left. There was also a burial ground the locals were trying to preserve. Plus, I think it may be illegal. Anyway, there were still people who would dig next to the quad trails trying to find these artifacts. To dig for these artifacts, you need to go about less than a foot into the clay, and usually that's where they'd be. To do this, you only need small gardening tools. Hand trowel, hand shovel, etc. You wouldn't use anything bigger because you'll dig too deep. While I was riding my quad one day with my friend on the back, I came around a tight corner with no view what was around the the turn because it was so grown in, going way too fast because I was just a reckless kid. I came to a dead stop when a man was in the most misplaced spot right in the way of the trail. This isn't the biggest town and growing up there my whole life, there wasn't many people I didn't know, especially in the woods because it was my frequent hangout and, I, and I've never seen this guy before. This trail was up above the trail where people normally dig on the very top of the cliff overlooking the river where anyone would know not to dig for artifacts because it's too rocky. This guy was just as startled as I was. He nervously locked eyes with mine and we just stared at each other for a couple seconds. He doesn't say a word, I don't say a word because he was creepy as hell looking. And then he nervously blurts out, I'm digging for arrowheads. I think I just gave him a head nod, and because he was blocking the way I put the quad in reverse and started backing down the trail slowly, keeping eye contact the entire time. I took notice to the fact he had a regular wooden-handled steel digging shovel with two large black garbage bags behind him that were definitely filled with something. He had already dug a pretty big hole, I'd say at least three foot deep and five foot wide. The tone in his voice was like he knew I didn't believe for a second he was digging for arrowheads. Nobody that knew they were there was that uninformed on the tools needed to find them. Me and my friend both thought what was in those bags, but as kids we kind of brushed it off and went about our day. It wasn't till a year or two later I really thought about it, and I went back to the spot I guess to dig them up and find out I don't quite remember what my intentions were. That location was so grown in, I couldn't pinpoint exactly where he was standing, so I never did find it again. I tried a couple more times later, but nothing ever came out of it. Until this day, I always wonder why that guy was so shady, if he was burying a human body or body parts. If so, he was smart, because people didn't venture up there, and he knew it would only become more grown in. As a child saw a ghost of what looked like either an elderly miner or a farmer, except wearing a striped cap like railway workers wore in the 30s, in a section of our home's basement which was being extended. The opened up area was about 10 feet wide and equally deep, was still mostly filled with dirt except for where the foundation had been knocked out to add the expanded room. He just sat in a crouch looking at me. I was about 10, and of course my family wrote it off as me being afraid of the dark, which I was. Years later, my mom saw him too in the finished room. No idea who he was or why he was there. He never spoke. Still curious almost 50 years later about why he was there. When I was at university, I had my crush over to watch a movie. It ended around midnight. As we were walking out of my living room, I turned off the lights and gave her a hug. She buried her face in my neck, one of those cute sort of hugs. When she looked up, she froze with her face just visible out of the corner of my eye. 
She had the most terrified expression, and her arms just locked me in place. Never been that squeezed, crushed before. I'm kind of chill at first, like, okay, this is weird, but not that weird. Then she just starts trembling and crying without moving her face at all, and I'm just stuck there, convinced she is seeing someone, something over my shoulder. I start pushing her away and saying, this isn't funny, what the EIF. She doesn't let go, and this goes on for two minutes straight. Meanwhile, I'm just repeating, what the you, what the if, over and over, convinced I'm about to get stabbed or possessed by whatever the F she is staring at. She gave a shudder at the end and just glanced at me with a look that said, What's gotten into you? I say, What the F just happened? And she just stares at me blankly like she has no idea what I'm talking about. I told her she needed to leave and then I drove to spend the night at a friend's dorm room on the floor. Never been so freaked out in my life. For anyone wondering, I did see her again and more shit happened, but never to that level of creep show. I'm a softy at heart, and I figured the girl just needed help or had some level of emotional instability. We were in Skycomish overnight in July 2007 for an event, and there also happened to be some kind of town reunion, so the hotel was full. My youngest was almost one and woke up crying and simply would not stop which was unusual for her. I grew concerned that she would wake up people in the rooms nearby, so went out to the car to drive around a bit, thinking that might soothe her to sleep. Skycomish is a tiny mountain town on Highway 2 along the Skycomish River, and the railroad does stop there for freight. It consists of a four-block square of streets, and a bridge crosses over the river to Highway 2, which I would not cross since I didn't want to be on the highway at night. Around and around, slowly, and with the window down as it was warm, I drove the square while my baby was quiet, but she would immediately cry if I went back to park at the hotel. Back we went, and the entire time I could hear the frantic cries of birds, yet could never see them. This twittering never stopped, and it didn't sound like bats, yet I still don't know what birds were crying in the dark like that. The strangest part was that I could drive alongside the rail yard in full view of the trains, tracks, and buildings where I could hear clanging and men talking, which seemed comforting except that I never spotted a single person. There were lights and train engines were running, yet all this bustling activity never revealed the sight of a single person. The worst part for me was that my baby never did go back to sleep until after daybreak, so I was out the entire night among all the unknoise. As I said, I don't think it was supernatural, but I wish I knew what the sounds were. I thought of it a couple of years ago when a young woman named Gia Fuda disappeared there and was feared dead, yet was found eight, nine days later alive, sitting naked next to the river with no memory of where she'd been. I will never stay overnight there again. I'm from Oslo City in Norway, but when I was a teenager, we moved to a bit more remote place about 30 minutes outside the city. Mostly houses and woods and moose, badger, fox, wolf, and lynx around, but mostly lots of roe deers, whose way used to humans. No farms and stables in the nearby area. No homeless people in the teens who snuck out usually hung around the mall to steal fresh delivered Napoleon cake from the bakery's loading dock. We lived quite central by a mall, school, and such. There was a small forest behind our house, maybe five kilometer radius. One summer, two friends and I went camping for one night in the small forest. We were 14, 15 years old girls. There was a bonfire place about 100 meter from my house where we put up the tent. The ground is packed tight and has this hollow sound when you walk on it. The tent was big for three and kind of round so it would be hard for someone to reach the top without collapsing on the tent wall. And it was an old tent, and the fabric was quite rotten. It did not rain that night. We did not bring any food or food equipment except candy that we had inside the tent. What happened? 
We sat up gossiping and eating candy until midnight. When we tried to sleep, we heard hooves walking beside the tent. We laid still listening, pretty sure there were curious roe deers. But it was also this rattling sound of metal that seemed weird. Not like tin cans, but just like night armor sound from movies. Suddenly it started to blow up with strong wind, and we started talking to easy atmosphere. The hooves and metal sound reminded me of a knight on a horse. Then my one friend said that sounds like two knights. We brushed it off as roe deers, but we never heard them leave. We kept talking when suddenly the wind ripped open a huge gash in the middle of the tent roof, right above me, in strong light. Can only describe it as a lightning came through the opening. We screamed and the wind stopped and the light disappeared as quickly as it came. We didn't hear anything around us. It was dead silence. No sound of footsteps or hooves. No sound of helicopter or anything. We just looked at each other and panicked out of the tent and run to my place for the rest of the night. Went back next morning and took down the tent and looked around. Found nothing that could help us figure out what happened. We did not drink or take drugs that night. My parents slept, so it couldn't be them messing with us. I've been much around in this little forest in my teens. Never experienced weird things before or after. In the aftermath, we nervously landed on some kind of rare lightning and roe deers with one foot in a metal can. But we didn't believe that either. One year ago this weekend, I took a solo backpacking trip to the Otter Creek Wilderness in West Virginia. Plan was for 16-mile loop over one night. Due to impassable river, I put camp up about a mile in. Beautiful spot with campsites along river, wonderful weather. I hung out, hiked around, and enjoyed the solitude. I had not and did not see another person since entering the forest roads. Mid-afternoon, I decided to lay down in the tent and just relax, nap. I'm awoken after about 45 minutes by the sound of a metallic clattering, closest description. Take a round fire pit or large grill grate and drop it on its side, and it's close. Of course, I assume other people. Nothing. No sign of anyone anywhere and nothing in the area that could be counted for that sound. Curious and confused, I go about my day. Later, explored more dinner, fire, and enjoying the forest night. Around 9.30, I heard a distinct single knock come from the hillside above me. As I turned to shine flashlight in that direction and saw nothing, another single knock came from over my left shoulder, closer to the river. I don't think it was a cross river, as it was pretty clear. Suddenly feeling not alone, I packed up and headed out, slept in my truck with no other issues. I'm well aware of knocking reports. Anyone have anything similar to the metallic sound experience? My name is Adam. I'm a Navy SEAL, a warrior forged by sweat, grit, and a relentless pursuit of excellence. Home is where my heart lies with my loving wife and two beautiful daughters. They are my beacon of light amidst the darkest of storms, my anchor in turbulent seas. The serenity of a quiet evening was shattered by the shrill ring of a phone. I knew what it meant. Duty was calling. A quick goodbye kiss to my girls, a firm embrace with my wife, and I was off, boarding the Black Hawk with my team of eleven hardened seals, men I trusted with my life. Our destination was an oil rig in the middle of the ocean, a mechanical behemoth now shrouded in unnerving silence. All communication had abruptly ceased, and it was our job to find out why. As we landed on the rig, we were met not by the expected crew, but by something far more terrifying, an unknown aquatic creature of monstrous proportions. Its scales shimmered with a menacing iridescence, its eyes burning with a predatory intelligence. The rig had become its kingdom. We, the invaders, were met with relentless fury. The creature lunged, its vast form whipping through the air, and my brothers fell one by one. The rig, groaning under the strain of the battle and the creature's monstrous weight, was a ticking time bomb ready to explode at any moment. 
In the midst of the chaos, I remembered my training. A creature of the ocean would likely have a sensitivity to sound, a weakness we could exploit. I rallied the remaining men, directing them to create a cacophony. We fired into the metal walls of the rig, the deafening echoes reverberating through the structure. The creature, disoriented in invisible pain, retreated, fleeing back into the depths from which it came. We, the surviving two, were left amidst the wreckage of the rig. The bodies of our fallen brothers, a stark reminder of the cost of our victory, we returned to base. The grim silence filled with unspoken grief. Ten of my brothers had fallen, men of honor and courage. But we had survived, had fought an unknown terror, and emerged victorious. As I embraced my waiting family, their joy was tinged with sadness, a reflection of the heavy price of the duty we bore. I work as a ranger at the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona, and let me tell you, it's an incredible job. Not only do I get to witness the breathtaking beauty of nature, but I also have the opportunity to meet fascinating people from all walks of life. The park management takes great care of our accommodations, ensuring that our rooms and stations are comfortable and well-maintained. They even renovate them every year before the massive tourist rush. And the meals they provide are not only delicious, but also fulfilling. I genuinely love my job. You may be aware that the Grand Canyon National Park shares a boundary with the Navajo region. As I patrol that side of the park, visitors often ask me if I've had any strange experiences, or if the Navajo people are spooky. According to our training sessions and briefings, the Navajo prefer to keep to themselves, which is why I haven't encountered them near the park or at least I hadn't until the other day. It happened when I saw an older Navajo man around 70 years old near the park. He had a hunched back and was dressed in the typical Native American attire. Curious and concerned, I approached him and asked if he needed any assistance with navigation. He appeared lost, but as soon as I spoke, his eyes opened wide and he grabbed my hands with an unexpectedly strong grip that even caused me some discomfort. I didn't expect the old man to possess such strength. With a firm hold on my hands, he pulled me closer, so we were staring directly into each other's eyes. His voice became hushed, and he spoke in a mysterious tone. He informed me that he had been searching for me since that morning, and had only just found me. Bewildered, I asked if I knew him, but he dismissed that question as irrelevant. What he said next sent chills down my spine. He claimed he was seeking me out to warn me about my impending death. I was left speechless, unable to comprehend what he was saying. I repeatedly asked him who he was, trying to make sense of the situation. At that moment, I thought he must be delusional, given his age and the fantastical nature of his words. I shrugged off his warning and decided to guide him back to the gate that led to the Navajo region. As we approached the gate, I noticed some other Native Americans waiting for the old man. To my surprise, as soon as they saw him with me, they rushed toward us and swiftly whisked the old man away. Their speed and urgency made me wonder what was really going on. I watched them disappear into the distance and returned to my daily duties, dismissing the encounter as an eccentricity of the old man. The rest of the day was uneventful, except for helping a couple who had lost their child in the park. Thankfully, we located the child after a thorough search. After sunset, I went back to my unit, took a break, ate some food, and tried to relax. I was lying on my bed, engrossed in a book, when I heard a distant shriek. Although faint, it caught my attention, and I instinctively turned towards my radio, anticipating a message about the sound. But the radio remained silent. I waited for a few more moments, but there was no response. Shrugging it off is perhaps a trick of the wind. I returned to my reading. However, the same sound echoed through the night, this time louder and closer. Without hesitation, I sprang to my feet, already preparing myself for action. I thought maybe I was the only one who heard it, which seemed strange. Leaving my firearm behind, I rushed outside, following the direction from which the sound seemed to originate. It was a dark night and the silence intensified the rustling noises that came from a distance. 
The shriek echoed once again, this time sounding like an injured animal in distress. I proceeded cautiously, moving slowly toward the source of the sound. As I neared the spot, my heart raced and a chill ran down my spine. Something emerged from behind a tree, and I struggled to find words to describe what I saw. It was a figure, bent down on all fours, growling with drool dripping from its mouth. Instinctively, I reached for my flashlight and directed its beam toward the creature. What I saw in that moment sent shivers through my entire being. The creature hissed and locked its black, menacing eyes onto mine. Its gaze pierced through me, leaving me paralyzed with fear. I turned on my heels and sprinted back toward the safety of the ranger station. Panic consumed me as I realized I had left my firearm inside, but there was no time to retrieve it. The only thought on my mind was reaching the station and securing myself inside. I barged into the station, slamming the door shut behind me. I made my way to the security room and quickly checked the surveillance cameras. One of the cameras focused on the area outside the station, and to my horror, it revealed the creature chewing on something. I couldn't make out the details, but its inhuman action sent a shiver down my spine. I remained inside the station, glued to the monitors until the creature disappeared from sight, moving away on all fours. Only then did I double check all the cameras to ensure it was truly gone. Feeling a mix of relief and lingering unease, I stepped outside and hurried straight to my room, locking the door behind me. The following day, I gathered the other rangers and shared the harrowing experience with them. We reviewed the recordings from the previous night, and their reactions mirrored my own fear and disbelief. From that moment on, we became extra vigilant during our shifts, especially during the night. However, the creature never made another appearance, leaving us to question the nature of what we had encountered. But what haunted me even more was the memory of the old man who had warned me. His words echoed in my mind, refusing to fade away. Had he known about the creature, was there any truth to the stories he had shared? I couldn't shake off the sense of foreboding that lingered within me. Now, as a ranger at the Grand Canyon National Park, I remain on high alert, keeping a watchful eye on the surrounding wilderness. The beauty of the park continues to captivate visitors. But deep within me, I know that there are mysteries and dangers lurking just beyond the veil of its majestic landscapes. And as I continue my duties, I hold on to the memory of that encounter, a constant reminder to stay vigilant and respect the unknown forces that may dwell within the shadows of the Grand Canyon. I'm choosing to remain anonymous for this account. I was driving eastbound on Pleasant Hill Road, about one and a half miles west of Highway 164 in Richfield, when something caught my attention on the side of the road. Curiosity peaked, I decided to slow down and take a closer look. I stepped out of my car, shining my flashlight into the darkness, and that's when I noticed something in the trees. Two large eyes were staring back at me, positioned high above the ground. It took me a few seconds to trace those eyes down to what appeared to be legs. The creature stood there motionless, illuminated by the light reflecting off its eyes. As I observed the figure, I couldn't help but notice its towering height, well over seven feet. It was covered in fine hair and had long arms and proportionally large legs. The creature stood upright like a person but had the legs of a dog. Strangely, there was no sound at all, just complete silence surrounding this enigmatic being. After observing it for several seconds, I returned to my car and drove off, fully convinced of what I had just witnessed. I can say with 100% certainty that it was not a bear or anything similar. Having encountered bears during my off-duty bear hunting excursions, I was familiar with their appearance. This creature had a distinct canine-like resemblance that set it apart. The area where this incident occurred is known for unexplained sounds, including peculiar cries and screams emanating from the forest. Interestingly, a close friend of mine also reported seeing two large figures with fur in the same vicinity 
These figures were standing near a tree on the south side of the road, close to the shoulder. The road in that area is curvy, and my friend noticed eyes shine from these figures. He estimates that he observed them for about three seconds as his headlights illuminated the scene. He, too, is absolutely certain that he witnessed something unusual. Overwhelmed by the experience, he immediately called me while still driving. Around 45 minutes after his call, I joined him, and we returned to the site. We brought our dog along, but every time we approached the area where the sighting occurred, our dog started whimpering and refused to go any closer. As we neared the spot, something suddenly startled us from behind. A loud growl emerged from a single location next to the road, then moved into the nearby trees where it seemed like two animals were engaged in a fierce fight for about five seconds. We were taken aback by these disturbing sounds. It felt as though the creature or creatures were displaying aggression. We decided not to proceed further and stood there for a while listening to the eerie silence of the woods. Realizing that we needed to leave the area swiftly, we quickly got back into our vehicle and drove away at top speed, making sure we were out of the vicinity in case any more disturbances occurred. I called my friend as we sped down the road, seeking solace in the fact that the noises had ceased. I appreciate you taking the time to read this lengthy account. I wanted to ensure that you had all the information necessary to understand our experiences. The vastness of the Pacific Ocean seemed endless as our United States Special Forces elite team embarked on a routine naval exercise. We were trained to handle a multitude of scenarios, but little did we know that the most unexpected and harrowing encounter of our lives was about to unfold. As we sailed through the calm waters, our eyes caught sight of an ominous sight on the horizon, an abandoned cargo ship drifting aimlessly. Our curiosity peaked, we decided to investigate. A sense of trepidation crept up my spine as we boarded the derelict vessel, not knowing what to expect. The ship's interior was eerie, a ghostly echo of its former activity. Dust and cobwebs covered everything, and a stifling atmosphere hung in the air. But it was not the ship's emptiness that alarmed us. It was the cargo we discovered below deck. There, in the dim light, stood a creature that defied all logic and explanation. It was taller than any of us, easily dwarfing a pickup truck by a couple of feet. Its bones were encased in a haunting contrast of black and white, long arms half-stretched to its sides, as if it was daring us to challenge it. This cryptid creature was like nothing we had encountered before. Three-dimensional and imposing, it exuded an aura of deathly stillness. It seemed to absorb light around it, not reflecting anything in return. A deer skull formed its nightmarish face void of expression, yet evoking an unshakable sense of malevolence. Before we could fully process the enigma before us, the creature lunged at our team with unimaginable speed and ferocity. Chaos erupted as we struggled to defend ourselves against this formidable adversary. The creature's attack caught us off guard, and inflicted injuries on several of our soldiers. Instinct and training kicked in, and we retaliated with a hail of gunfire. The bullets hit the creature, causing it to roar in pain and anger, but it wasn't enough to bring it down. Despite our efforts, the cryptid managed to escape by leaping into the sea, disappearing beneath the waves with an eerie, vanishing act. We rushed to the ship's deck, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature's retreat, but it was as if it had never been there. The ocean lay calm and undisturbed, leaving us to wonder if the encounter had been a mere hallucination. As a special forces team, we were accustomed to facing danger head on, but this encounter left us shaken to our core. We knew we had encountered something beyond the realm of our understanding, a cryptid that defied all known laws of nature. It was an average summer day for us ten-year-olds in northern Illinois. It was a day just like any other before it. We saw the same people. We watched the same cars drive by, and we heard the same animals making the same noises they always make. There we were, 
the four of us taking a break from playing basketball, and for some reason I looked up. There it was, the biggest bird I'd ever seen flying out of the western sky, but I wasn't sure it really was a bird. When I first saw it, I was certain it was one of those custom, made biplanes that was just made to look like a bird. However, I noticed there wasn't any noise coming from its engines. That's when the beast's wings flapped. It was at that time I realized I was actually staring at a bird, bigger than any I had ever seen in my life. I shouted at my three friends to look up, partly so they could see this giant bird, and partly so I'd have someone to tell me if I was seeing things or not. At the time, I wasn't sure if any of them did look up. My eyes were fixed on the bird. I continued to watch it as it flew over my house, then off into the eastern sky. The entire sighting was only about 30 seconds, but those 30 seconds were etched into my mind forever. The bird itself was probably around 6 to 10 feet in length. As for its wingspan, I am certain that it was at least around 25 feet, maybe bigger. It was a dark brown color with no other marks that I could see. One thing that stands out in my mind is its huge claws. I had seen both vultures and birds of prey's claws, and something about these made me think of a bird of prey. The only part of the bird that I didn't get a good look at was its head. All I can remember seeing is its beak, and that was only for a brief moment. As for the other three witnesses, I am certain that two of them saw the bird too. As for the third one, he wasn't around when I looked to see if anyone else was present after the bird was out of my view. As for one of the other witnesses at the time of the sighting, and for a while after it, he agreed that we saw a rather large bird, but a couple of months after the sighting, he said he didn't remember seeing anything. As for the fourth witness, he has always agreed that we saw a giant bird that day. He remembers it being a dark color, but isn't sure which color because the sun was in his eyes from his viewpoint. One thing we don't agree on about the bird is its size. He thinks it was slightly bigger, around 12 feet with a wingspan of about 30 feet. That sighting was seven years ago, 1995, and to this day I'm not sure what it was. I know it wasn't a vulture or a hawk of some kind because I see those all the time around here. After reading about Thunderbirds, I believe that is what it was. I just wish I could get a glimpse of it again. One then I can be certain if all I saw was my imagination taking over for a moment, or a truly massive bird roaming the Midwestern skies. On February 27, 2023, my friend was driving home from work and passing down my country road sometime between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., less than a mile from my house at the end of my township, within 1,000 feet of the closest house. He saw an unknown creature. It was at the edge of the road as if it were about to cross. It was pitch black, very furry, and had a bob tail in the face of a pit bull. I could see its jowls. It had dog-like ears, slender but muscular, and was standing on all fours. When it saw me, it paid no attention to me, but slowly turned around and leaped back into the woods. When it leaped, it jumped like a frog. Its legs were turned out just like a frog. It was appropriately the size of a Great Dane on all fours. He was uncertain if it had humanoid feet and couldn't identify much else. Where he reported having seen it in a wooded area right beside a small bayou, southern Louisiana, and there is a notable nook that leads off into the woods, right around where he saw it. The very same night after he saw it, I heard strange noises around midnight, akin to something climbing a wooden structure, thuds and the sound of wood bowing, side events. Six or so years ago, I saw something strange leap between one section of woods to another, across a highway about a half mile from my home. It was black, hairy, and ape, like at a glimpse. About three years ago, me and my wife heard a tapping on the window behind us, around midnight. We laughed about it at first, but my cousin from across the street called me moments after and said, there's something big in your yard. 
I could hear it running through your yard. It's in the woods now. We investigated and heard it rustling through trees, but never saw it. The next morning, outside the window that was tapped on was a large humanoid footprint, barefoot. To tap on the glass would require something to stand upright, at least five feet minimum, given the lifted foundation. About three years ago, a buddy and I were hanging out, and we saw something strange walk into my cousin's yard across the street. It was large, black, and furry. It walked on all fours and appeared like a pig at first glance. We scoped in on it and couldn't determine what it was. It had a dog-like snout, but the stature and build of a hog. It was about the size of a large hog, or perhaps a large bear cub. I don't remember it having a tail. It sniffed around his house, circled it, and went back into the woods. About a year ago, I was driving at night from the far end of my road. There is a curve approximately a half mile from where my friend reported seeing the creature. In the curve, as I banked a bit, my headlight shined into the woods and revealed eye shine about six feet off the ground. I stopped the car next to where the eye shine was to examine it. I didn't see anything else, but the smell of rotting meat flooded the car, and I promptly left. About a year ago, I was outside around midnight when I heard a strange noise in my cousin's yard. I shined a flashlight over there and caught some eye shine at average height from the ground. It looked at me and kept walking into the wood line. In my experience, if you spotlight something and can see its eye shine, they stop and stare at you. This thing kept going, but watched me the whole time. I continued to shine into the wood line for a bit longer, and it returned, about 15 feet down the wood line. It stared at me from within the woods and turned around. I continued to shine my light and caught it one more time in the same place as the second encounter. It looked at me for a moment and turned away. I didn't see the eye shine again. At the time, I had an eerie feeling that it seemed too sentient to be a deer or a hog. Maybe a big cat, but no normal woodland critter from around here. I live in a fenced, but not gated, neighborhood. Road to the north, little stream, followed by two large, large for the suburbs. Property is then a small horse stable, then the rest of the suburbs to the east. Forest and a large horse, stable to the south, and a dollar general, then main road to the west. Overall, I live in a somewhat densely populated area, 3K, TPL. But where my neighborhood is, it's mostly suburbs and a few random pockets here and there that you'd think are in the boonies if you saw a picture of it without ever living here. Anyways, when I was little, currently 15, for whatever reason, I always went to the bathroom with the door open. I don't anymore thank God that habit changed. One day when I was seven, I saw a shadow with no body pacing back and forth in the hallway that lead to both my room and the bathroom, not getting too close to the bathroom and never getting too far from my line of sight. Imagine a backwards E as the layout of this hallway. Top horizontal bar is the stairs leading downstairs. Middle is my room. Bottom is the bathroom. You can't see past the stairs from the bathroom. I could tell where my room was because it was daytime, and my room has a long window near the roof, and the door was open, making that part of the hallway blue. It was of a tall, skinny woman with short, straight hair. We had no visitors but all my family. Brother, father, and mother was home. They were all downstairs, and like I said, you can't see further than the stairs from the bathroom. My mom is short, a bit overweight, and has long, curly hair. I got scared shitless, so I quickly finished and ran downstairs to tell him what happened. As I was finishing, I saw her stop in front of my room, turn towards it, then sort of disappear by fading away as she walked in. A few years later, I was talking to a neighborhood friend of mine who's the same age as me about ghosts. We were probably 11 or 12 at the time. I asked him if he had ever seen a ghost before, and without me having ever told him about what I saw at that point, he told me that one night, when he was ten, he woke up in the middle of the night and didn't know why. 
He looked towards his bedroom door, and there stood a shadow darker than the surrounding room of a tall, skinny woman with short, straight hair, seemingly staring right at him. His little sister is many years younger than us and slept with his mom, and his mom and sister are tall and skinny with long, wavy hair. He said it was 3D, so it had some depth to it. When I saw the ghost, I saw it was flat, like an actual shadow, until it walked into my room and faded away. After he told me his story, I told him mine. Not exactly the scariest thing ever, but it still gives me the creep sometimes thinking about it. Ever since I've known for myself, I have loved nature. I could even say that it's my passion, which is why the job of even a park ranger was perfect, until one day I worked at this nature park where the visitation hours were from, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. There were many of us, and our shifts changed every week, so one week I would do first, and the next week I would do second, and so on. One Friday I was second shift, which meant I would stay until everybody left and check. If everything is okay, then I was off. I did a short tour that a few visitors asked for that day, but other than that, it was pretty unengaged since I didn't have to do a lot. I was already walking and checking up everything long before I was supposed to be done with work. It already got dark, and I was walking through the woods. I noticed a flash of lightning at me from behind me on one of the trees in the distance. It was weird. I went to check it out, but as I got to the point that I thought the light was coming from, suddenly it came at me again from the place that I'd come from. It was super weird, and I yelled out, whoever was doing that, to knock it off. As I said, the flash of light came from a completely different direction. There's no way that a person could travel that way in such a short time. So I realized I was probably being messed with by two different people, figuring it was my co-workers, even though we weren't really close, nor do we ever do this kind of stuff. I yelled again. I was not going to participate in this stupid joke. Whoever or whatever it was should leave. I left. I did not have any control over this and could not do anything about it if they were purposefully trying to mess with me. So basically, it was my problem. I informed my supervisor that somebody could still be in the park. He said that he would take over. I left and got in my car and began to drive home. I live about ten minutes away from the park. Suddenly, I got a phone call from an unknown number. I answered it. Somebody told me in a raspy voice I should not have left them there all alone, that I would regret it. I told them to never call me again and hung up. When I got to work, they told me they had found a dead dog at the place I'd reported the flashing lights. This was the work of an insane individual who was messing with me, somebody who would do something so horrid. I was stationed at the FOB, Forward Observation Base, in Kamenica as a civilian contractor. I was driving one morning from the FOB to Camp Monteith to do a distribution run and pick up laundry and such. Halfway to Camp Monteith, you drive through a heavily wooded and hilly region, but not all that big and still somewhat populated. Hard for me to describe an exact location unless someone is actually familiar with the area. About two miles before you pass a restaurant called The Planet, I witnessed a hairy hominid coming down a fairly steep slope and then crossing the road in front of the vehicle, going from my right side, too. My left side. Nothing like what you hear from the American version of Bigfoot. Not sure what to call it, so we'll stick with a hairy hominid. This hairy hominid was only around five half feet tall. Only an estimate is I was in a four-wheel drive that sits kind of high. It was slender, bipedal, reddish, colored hair heavily matted around the buttocks and front groin area. Hair is longer on the head than on the rest of the body. The rest of the hair is three, four inches in length. Profile of face flat and dark, skinned, black. Hands were also black. Did not get a good look at the feet. No visible mammaries or other aids in determining sex. The sighting did not last too long, and there was also the shock factor involved. Trying to be as detailed as I can, 
I only saw the profile of the face, but was fairly flat and very dark. I saw the hands, but did not get a real good look at the feet as it moved in front of the vehicle and then across the road and down a slope into a valley. Hands were also very dark. I would say black as far as the face and hands go. I was curious after this happened. I was afraid of ridicule from my workmates and feared for my security clearance, so I kept quiet about it. But after finally talking to my wife about it, I feel I can share it with like-minded people. Does anyone know if hominids have a history of sightings in the Balkans or around Kosovo? I tried an internet search and came up empty. I hope I was thorough enough or detailed enough. This incident occurred at Carson Lake in the Grand Mesa National Forest of Colorado. The lake sits on the edge of what is called Land's Edge on the Grand Mesa. A friend and I were hunting. We had hiked down the Canna Creek Trail to look for game. We had spent most of the day on a stand. We made our way back to my truck, but decided to stay the night so we could hunt in the early morning and then go home. We were getting things set up for camp, building a fire, and getting food out to cook. I had a pop-up camper, and I had just got it up and situated when my friend said, What the heck is that sound? He had never spent as much time in the woods as I had, so he was freaked out instantly. I came out of the camper and asked him what was the problem. That is when I heard it. It's hard to explain how it sounded. It was a high-pitched but deep scream that lasted for long periods off and on. The sound goes up and down in volume. Whatever it was sounded angry for some reason. At first, I didn't give it much thought. I'd heard mountain lion screams, and that will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. But this sound went on and on, pausing for short moments as if to catch its breath. My friend was really freaked out now. I said to him, it's just a line or two lines across the lake. This did not calm him down much. I had my sidearm on me, so I pulled it out and shot off around in the air during the screaming. Then it was silent. I told him I scared it away. I started to go about getting food out so we could eat. The daylight was fading to the point where you can't quite see details across the lake, but you can still see movement and other features. About a minute after firing off the round in the air, the screaming started again. This time it was closer, but still across the lake. It seemed more pissed off, as if it was very mad we were here. We could hear the brush shaking and raking, but we could not see it, but just hear it. Now I'm getting freaked out because of what just happened. It was coming closer. You would think that a gunshot would scare game away, not bring it in closer. My friend is really getting freaked out and wants to leave immediately. I tell him we have high-powered rifles and we will be safe. The whole time we're talking about leaving, the screaming is going on. I eventually gave in to him wanting to leave and started to pack up camp. This took some time for us to do, maybe ten minutes or so. During this time, the screaming continued. We got everything loaded up in a hurry, buttoned up the camper, and got in the truck. I started it up and left. It was now dark, and the headlights were the only lights beside the stars. The drive up and out of the lake had a few switchbacks. I stopped at one to see if the screaming was still going on. It was not. We drove out of there and down the mountain, not saying a word. We had stopped to get a bite to eat. We felt unsure of what we had experienced. Both of us decided not to say anything to anyone. I know I didn't say anything to anyone. For a very long time, I am unsure if my friend has said anything to anyone. I have watched shows on TV about Bigfoot since then. Some of the shows had recorded sounds of what they said was a Bigfoot. To me, it sounded like what I had heard at the lake. I have a friend that had a similar experience in this same area at a later time. My friend said it was at night when he saw something tall and large cross the road. Also, during the day, he found some very large tracks. Some other friends said that they heard some screaming that sounded a lot like what I described in the area. They didn't tell the rest of the hunting party about what they heard until later, when the rest of them heard these screams in the middle of the night. It was loud enough to wake them up.
My wife and I were trying out our truck's new tires and went up this logging road. I stopped to look at this valley in the moonlight. I stopped the truck and rolled down the window. We heard this rock hit the graveled road, but we were not moving. We then heard this extremely bone-chillingly loud scream and what sounded like trees' branches breaking and being thrashed about. The sound was like no other sound imaginable. I'll never forget it. We lived just two miles from this place, and this was the first time I felt this scared up there on the mountain. This one night, my senior year after homecoming, I decided to stay at one of my friend's house. Including me, there was about five other people there. We usually would mess around with a spirit box or whatever because we were bored high schoolers in the Appalachian Mountains. What else were we supposed to do? We messed around with it for a while. Then my friend had an idea to play with an IJ board while the others were just chilling on the bed. We weren't getting any results by playing around with it, so we stopped and went back to the spirit box. My father died a few years back, and the spirit box said his name, then powered itself off. Me and my friends were in shock, of course, so we decided to call it quits for the night. About an hour passed, and my friend had to go outside to go feed his chicken. When he went outside, we heard some tapping on the window, so we thought it was him playing a joke on us. So we sent our other friend outside to check on him. Then the tapping began again. At this point, we were like, wow, so funny guys, thinking they both were in on it. Then we heard walking upstairs. We were in the basement of the house, which was weird because no one was there other than my friends in the basement and the two outside. Suddenly, the two who were outside bursted inside. The friend who went out first was a pretty big guy who never got scared by anything. His face was completely pale, like he had seen a ghost, so we were like, what the hell happened? Apparently, when he was outside feeding his chickens, he heard something walking in the woods. At first, he thought it was a deer or maybe some other animal. But when he went inside the chicken house, apparently he heard someone whisper, please help me, in an airy and deep, struggling voice. My friends who were in the basement decided to go back outside with him just to check if there was anyone on the property, so obviously they went outside with guns because we're county bumpkins. I decided to stay inside because it was colder than a witch's tit outside. I was sitting in my friend's computer chair just chilling when suddenly it sounded like someone was running around upstairs. Hell, it was everywhere. It even sounded like it was in the walls at one point. So I ran like hell outside barefoot in like 30 degree weather. I found the guys by the chicken coop and asked if they were pranking me and explained what happened. But all of them had been outside. It was just unexplainable. We only used the UIJ board for a few minutes, but there was just something off. Especially since things were happening outside the house and inside. I've been thinking about posting this for a while. Has anyone else had a similar experience? One of my old drinking buddies back home was the token hunter of our group, a great dude who always had stories. One day he shows up to a party looking kind of spooked, so we ask him what's wrong. Apparently him and his hunting buddy were a few kilometers away from their truck, just enjoying the hike through the gorgeous Alberta wilderness. They had their deer tags and were just out enjoying the process. After a few hours of unsuccessfully searching for deer, they turned around and headed back, following their own tracks in, to get out. Turns out that there were fresh mountain lion tracks that started almost immediately from the truck and followed their footsteps the entire way into the bush. They had been followed by a mountain lion the minute they got out of the truck and had no idea. He had said that it wasn't uncommon to see mountain lion tracks but apparently something about being the singular focus of one for so many hours had the two completely spooked. I get it, man. That's some apex predator nonsense that I want new to part of. I went on a small trek with a couple of my friends in dense forest, and while coming back down, it was dark already. 
As we walked down the mountain, we used our torch, which was almost dying. So in midway, we heard some noise and trees, but we didn't see any animal there. We thought there may be monkeys hovering upon trees, and we decided to make loud noise with some metal stuff we had, as the monkeys won't come near. Now an hour passed, we were almost down the mountain. Still, we could hear noises in trees, but no sight of any animals. As we reached down, there was a small temple with dim light, where we decided to rest as we felt safe. Now the forest part was over, and there was huge barren farmland with clear sight, no trees around, and we had to walk two kilometer more to reach our car. After fifteen minutes of rest, we decided to go ahead. As we stepped out of the temple, we saw two huge black bears passing by. They were barely seven, eight feet away from us. They followed us all the way down the mountain, and luckily they went on the other direction. We ran the shit out of there until we reached our car. Hiking in Big Bend National Park on a super remote trail on the east side of the park. I was completely alone, and there was absolutely no ranger station or a civilization for at least 30 miles. As I approached the seventh mile of a 14-mile trail, I stop and take in the scenery. Due to the remoteness of Big Bend and being in the low desert at noon, it was completely silent. As I'm approaching a large canyon pictured below, I get a hunch. I always hike alone, and I'm a little paranoid, so I always try to be aware of my surroundings. As I stop, I hear a giant noise that I can only describe as a roaring lion scream combined into one sound. It seemed to be lower in the canyon, but it echoed through the silence. I was pretty sleep-deprived, so I brushed it off as a hallucination or something. Then I hear it again. This time it was loud, and it seemed to be right up the trail. I get that fight-or-flight response. Sweaty palms, dry mouth, shaking. My biggest fear is a mountain lion, and I was afraid that I had messed up going on this trail alone. As I was in my stance, I just screamed him, not scared of you bitch, as loud as I could. After a couple of screams, a creature appears up the trail. It was a wild burrow, left by old settlers. He hawing its way down the canyon wall. It just looked at me for a second and kept going. I used to work for my brother doing landscape work on foreclosed houses. Usually we just mowed the lawn so it didn't get out of hand, and the house looked at least decent to anyone who might want to buy them. In some cases, we would have to clean leftover stuff out of them as well. Eventually, my brother would send me out on my own for the simple lawn care cases or to take pictures of newly foreclosed houses so the banks could assess what needed to be done. In this particular case, I was sent to a new house in the town beyond the deliverance, Esktown in my area. After the 45-minute drive out through a heavily forested area, I arrived to take exterior and interior pictures. I take the exterior shots no problem, however, when I put the key in the door to go inside the door, it just opens and I'm hit with a cold, musty air and hear something scurry upstairs. Needless to say, I turned around and deemed the house unsafe to enter with a bank. More, for there might be someone squatting in there. Danger than danger. From damage to the house. For some reason, before I left, I took a picture of the house with my phone, and it always creeped me out when I saw it. I have a story that goes back to the early 1970s. I'm from Linwood, Washington. I was traveling across Nevada from Idaho down to California, and it was early in the morning, and I was outside of Winnemucca, Nevada, about 5.30 or 6 a.m. I was by myself. It was out in the desert area, and it was virtually uninhabited. A car came up behind me with two inhabitants who basically started following right on my bumper. I became concerned because it was apparent that they were really interested in getting me stopped. They would pull up alongside and motion me over and things like that. I was afraid. So as we went along, this played out for several miles, and they kept motioning for me to pull over, and they came up alongside, and I became quite fearful. Well, the oddest thing happened. 
Somehow I was getting a flat right front tire as I could feel the car start to sway. I pulled up to a stop and off to the right was a house. These people pulled up in the car and stopped behind me. I didn't know what to do. I was afraid to get out and somebody came out of the house to a pickup truck that was running. And now this was the only house in the area. There was no other house around. And the older man walked out and he looked in one of the people in the car, pointed to this guy, and they went ahead and pulled on by me and took off. So I got out, and I looked at the man, and he was doing something around the pickup. So I went ahead and got my tire out and changed it and went on my way. Well, it made me quite fearful. On the way back from California, on the way back to Idaho, I looked for this place. I wanted to stop because it left such a mark on me psychologically. I found the place. It was totally uninhabited, absolutely abandoned. No windows, no doors, just an old shack. I honestly feel that something kept me from being harmed. Something chased these two guys away. Was it a guardian angel looking over me? That is what happened? I always loved the idea of camping in the woods. There's something about the serenity of nature that draws me in. So, when my friend suggested we go on a camping trip deep in the woods, I jumped at the chance. Little did I know that it would be a decision that would change my life forever. As we set up our campsite, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The woods were so dark and dense that I could barely see anything beyond the reach of our campfire. But I brushed it off, thinking that it was just my nerves getting the best of me. As the night fell, we huddled around the fire, telling scary stories and roasting marshmallows. But soon enough, we heard strange noises coming from the woods. At first, we thought it was just an animal, but as the noises grew louder, we knew that it was something else entirely. Suddenly, out of the darkness emerged a creature that I had never seen before. It was massive and covered in fur, with razor-sharp claws and glowing red eyes. We tried to run but it was too fast. It tackled us and we fell to the ground. We fought back with all our might, but it was too strong. We managed to get away, but we were badly injured. We stumbled through the woods trying to find a place to hide. We had no idea what had just happened to us. As we huddled in the woods, we realized that we were being hunted. The creature was still out there and it was getting closer. We had to act fast. We gathered whatever weapons we could find and prepared for the worst. The creature emerged from the darkness once again, but this time we were ready. We attacked it with all we had, and after a fierce battle, we managed to take it down. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that it was something that didn't belong in our world. As we limped back to our campsite, we were confused and terrified. We had just encountered something that we couldn't explain, something that defied all logic. We packed up our gear and left the woods, vowing never to return. To this day, I still have nightmares about that creature. I can't shake the feeling that it's still out there, lurking in the darkness, waiting to strike again. The woods may seem peaceful and serene, but there are secrets hidden in their depths that we may never understand. This morning I woke up at my usual time, 5 a.m., to go to the gym before classes. I'm off campus staying with my parents, however. They are away for a month, so I've had the house to myself. Well, anyways, every morning I wake up, let my dog out to go do his business, shower or brush my teeth, and let him back inside before I get dressed and leave. This morning I woke up feeling a little weird. The house had a strange energy, and my gut sensed that something was up. I let my dog out into our pitch-black backyard. The deck light didn't turn on like it usually does, which is unusual, but I thought nothing of it and went to go shower. After my shower, I went back to the sliding glass door to my dog in, and I could see him sitting there waiting for me. I opened the door and watched him, a large black lab, walk in and under a table. I then proceeded to close the door and walk to my room to get dressed. Here's where it gets weird. 
As I was leaving the area where the back door is, I felt that same strange feeling that I had been feeling all morning. I decided to look at the dog's bed and noticed he wasn't in it. So I looked back at the door and saw, to my utter confusion, that he was still sitting outside. My stomach instantly dropped. I could have sworn on my life that I watched him come in the house and under a table. I walked back to the door, let my actual dog inside, and instantly searched my house to see if another animal came inside. Instead, I didn't find anything. As I thought more about it, the thing I let in before looked more like a shadow rather than a dog, and it moved differently, although it was around the same size. I called my girlfriend to tell her about it as she was waiting for me at the gym, and she said it was probably just my imagination. But I have never, ever imagined something this real. I wasn't even tired. I noticed that my dog was acting a little strange, too, staring at one of our walls and growing quietly. I left soon after that and got on with my day. I'm at a loss. If anyone has a possible explanation to ease my nerves, because I'm really dreading sleeping there alone tonight. My husband, Kid, and I live out in the middle of nowhere on a plot of land that's about 100 acres. I'd say probably 90. Five of those acres are wilderness with that fee and hiking trails that we, and several of the previous owners created by exploring, we use that land for camping, hiking, and hunting. We like to find a spot, clear it a bit, and camp overnight. There's so much space we've never stayed in the same place twice. We've seen some kill sites both old and fresh. Lots of animal tracks, places where deer bed down, etc. I've even spent a lot of time hiking solo while the kid is in school and husband's at work. Whether alone or with the family, we always carry a firearm for protection. A few weeks ago, we decided to load up our camping gear and start a new trail. We mark the trails we make with spray paint on trees. We were pretty far in the woods, having hiked almost an hour when the atmosphere seemed to change. I don't know who noticed it first, but my husband, who was leading the three of us, turned around and gave me a concerned look. The birds had stopped chirping. The insects were quiet. There were no sounds around us. When in the woods, complete quietness is rarely a good thing. We continued onward, hyper aware of our surrounds, while our kid continued merrily talking. We came to the stream that marks the midway point of our property. We stopped for a few minutes, my husband and I, in a stare down with each other. We both felt something was off, but didn't want to scare our daughter. I finally broke the silence and said I suddenly didn't feel good and that we should go home. My husband nodded in agreement while our daughter voiced her protest. Too bad, kiddo. We turned around and started back. After going a few hundred yards, still in silent wilderness, I looked to my right and saw a person crouched down in a gill suit about 150 feet off our trail. I'm positive they saw that I noticed them, but they never moved. I cleared my throat to get my husband's attention, and when he looked back, I put my hand on the gun and the holster on my hip, which caused him to readjust his rifle in preparation of anything. I sped up my family and we hurried back home. I told my husband as soon as we were inside. We decided to call the police and report the trip lesser, filed a report, and was told to call again if we saw anyone. A few days later, my husband and I went out alone and set up a bunch of deer cams. We didn't go back out into the woods for maybe a week. Then he and I ventured out to retrieve the cam footage. Out of the nine cams we placed, we caught a person in a ghillie suit and two images. We handed copies over to the cops to go with our report. We haven't gone back out since except to check the deer cams. Haven't gotten any other trespassers. It freaks me out even more to think of the few times while camping that we heard walking near our tent in the middle of the night. We always assumed it was curious animals, but now I'm not so sure. My fiancé sees nightmarish stuff while he's half asleep. He hates scary movies and anything like them, but he frequently has nightmares. About once a month or more, he gets up, tense and ready to fight, looking intently at something across the room. 
Once he told me there was a big mother up behind the bedroom door. Once there was a green slime coming out of the wall. Once there was a monster perched on my desk getting ready to jump at us. Every time he does this, he eventually just rolls over and goes back to sleep. Whether I gently tell him he's dreaming or not, and he remembers nothing in the morning. One night I went to bed before him, and I just had this feeling there was something under the bed. I wouldn't let my arms or feet hang off the edge of the bed and stayed burrito wrapped in my blanket. He eventually came to bed and fell asleep. Then sometime in the middle of the night, he woke me up telling me, whatever you do, don't let your feet hang off the end of the bed. If you do, they'll get you. I weakly cried. What? He answered. They tried to cut off my hand. I didn't sleep much that night. How did we both have the feeling something was under the bed on the same night? The only time that's ever happened in our eight-year relationship. So according to my family, I was a creepy as if little kid. My mom basically refuses to talk about it and claims she prayed it all away. But I mean, who knows? I don't remember any of it myself. Most of my stories are from my older sister, who my mom would always talk about this stuff with. So anyways, I was around four and a half. My mom and dad had been trying for another baby for, I guess, around a year and a half, and it wasn't happening, so they basically stopped trying. My mom and I were home alone one day, and she was in the kitchen washing dishes or something. From another room, I walked in, went up to her, and hugged her stomach for a few seconds. I then looked up at her and told her, you're going to have a baby, and he's going to live to be as old as I am, then detached from her and walked away again. She ended up being pregnant with my brother, who was then born with a birth defect that caused him to pass away when he was four and a half years old. Edit, a few people asked for more, so here's another. So I had an imaginary friend, Gaiwa. Quick side story, I actually used to have two, but according to my sister, Jawa got rid of the other one. Anyways, my mom wanted me to do something, eat my veggies, take a bath. Something kids don't like. I don't remember. I got upset and told her Gawa was going to get her back tonight. She didn't think much of it. But the next morning, her whole right arm was bruised up. I guess with one even resembling someone's hand grabbing her by the arm. She has no memory of what happened, but my sister said my mom felt like she was in pain. And one more. I guess my mom and dad were in a rough patch and were seeing a counselor. The counselor told my mom that when she was really mad at him, to write letters and then throw them away. So one night she got me into bed and then after a while started writing these letters. My dad worked nights. I guess they were in a big fight, so my mom wrote a good amount of letters that night. She would write one, crumple it up, and then throw it behind her into the trash. Fast forward to the morning. My mom was making me breakfast and I was sitting at the table. There wasn't anything in front of me, no paper or anything. But I started doing these motions like I was crumpling something up and throwing it behind me. She asked what I was doing, and I told her I was doing what she was doing last night. The night before, she was in a room with the door locked. No way I could see him. This happened a week or so ago. I don't know exactly what time it was, but it was dark. I live on a farm. I was walking home after putting our farm animals to bed when I passed an old, practically fallen, down barn on our property. It's in bad condition. It nearly collapsed on my mother once upon a time. I glanced at the barn as I neared it and witnessed a huge, bulky, maybe winged thing duck away into the barn, incredibly fast. It seemed to me like it cowered away when I looked at it, like it didn't want to be caught watching me. It was huge, seemingly too big to fit through the large open window at the front of the barn where it appeared to be perched. Its eyes were tiny and glistening white. Once I saw the thing, I ran as fast as I could for my house. I felt a sensation that made me feel like something was rushing towards me incredibly but never reaching me. That's the only way I can explain it. I still don't like going outside on my own when it's dark. And that barn freaks me out a bit. Once in a while, I hear noises from seemingly within it. 
It sounds like somebody setting down a pile of wooden planks over and over. It could be an echo from elsewhere on the property, but I don't know. I also feel like it may have just been my mind playing tricks on me, but it seemed too unnaturally real. I feel like the barn is watching me whenever I pass it. I grew up listening to the eerie tales and legends that were woven into the very fabric of our small Irish village. One story that I still vividly remember is that of the widower and his late wife. In our village there lived a couple who had a beautiful house, but never had any children. The wife's death hit the husband hard, leaving him in a cloud of sorrow. She was buried far away, almost on the outskirts of another city. Yet whispers began to spread that the wife was visiting her husband every night, even in death. Residents living near the widower's house reported a terrible stench in the early hours, accompanied by mournful moans echoing through the darkness. They claimed to have seen a decaying figure entering the house on several occasions. Fearful of what might happen, the neighbors warned the widower about the strange nightly visitor. He, however, denied experiencing anything unusual. Suspicions grew among the villagers who believed that the widower was hiding a macabre secret relationship with his deceased wife. One fateful night, they saw the rotting woman, covered in mud and dressed in rags, wandering close to the houses before making her way to the widower's home. As dawn broke, the villagers found muddy footprints leading inside the house, yet the widower still denied the rumors. No one could ever prove that it was, indeed, the late wife visiting her husband. But the legend persisted, and it said that after the widower passed away, the ghostly woman was never seen again. Stories like these are a testament to the rich folk lore that makes Ireland so enchanting. From tales of gnomes, elves, and leprechauns, there is no shortage of strange and mysterious beings that capture our imaginations. As I've grown older, I've come to appreciate these stories even more, recognizing that there is far more to the world than what meets the eye. And though these tales may send shivers down our spines, they also serve as a reminder of the magic and wonder that lie just beneath the surface of our everyday lives. One night about 3 a.m., while walking home from work to our apartment in Century Towers, Pitt Street, Sydney, we saw what we jokingly referred to as man, but we lived in the then New Century Towers on the 52nd floor when staying close to work. One of our businesses was the Penthouse Gentlemen's Club, a 24-7 day business that we normally took turns to manage. Hence, we kept an apartment in the busy city. My business partner, Michael, was an accomplished accountant. He finished second in the country in tax law and has an IQ of 185. I'm a more normal bloke who had a background in security and also owned a demolition company in Adelaide, South Australia. My point is, we were both business. Type guys who, although drink on occasion, are not drug users and were very sober on this occasion. Anyhow, that night we were walking home casually, enjoying some friendly banter about our day in work. As we crossed the sad street to our building, I happened to look up, and only about one level or story above us, I clearly saw this humanoid creature gliding with wings fully outstretched. The wings were of membrane-type appearance, and the head was scoping left to right as it glided around the corner of the opposite building to our apartment. The head or face wasn't human. It looked a little bit cone, shaped maybe even slightly reptilian, and I didn't see the eye color. Quite frankly, I was in shock and scared at the same time. It seemed that Michael and I quickened our stride toward our own building, and I already had my pass in hand to swipe the security device to open the doors to our foyer. Meanwhile, we had both stopped talking as we hurried into the well-lit lobby. We both acknowledged the night manager's security on the way to the elevator. Once inside the lifts, Michael turned to me and said in a higher than normal excited voice, Did you see that? What the F was that? I don't know what it was, and it was many years ago now, in 2005. 
On occasion, I've Google searched to see if anyone else has ever reported something similar, and today is the first time I have, being your videos. I have studied various religions, their origins, and Gnostic teachings for many years, and have my own theories, but it's all guessing, really. Anyhow, I thought I'd tell you for your own reference. was on a solo hunt in the Trinity's back in 2015. I hiked into a remote area off trail and set up camp for the night. Laying there in my bag looking up at the stars, I noticed a very faint flash, almost imperceptible, and at first I thought it was just my imagination. After a few more flashes, I realized it was some kind of light coming from the ground level and not from up in the sky because I could see the underside of the trees light up each time it happened. Thinking it may be a trail cam, I laid there as still as possible, thinking maybe movement was triggering it, but it kept happening. Thinking maybe it was on some kind of timer, I started counting to see if the flashes were evenly spaced. The flashes were happening at random intervals. This went on for at least an hour until I finally drifted off to sleep. The next morning, I searched high and low for a trail cam or anything out of the ordinary, but found nothing. Still don't really know what it was that I was seeing, but I know there were definitely flashes going off like a camera flash, except very faint, but enough to illuminate the bottom side of the branches and the trees around me. Made me a little uneasy for the rest of the trip. I was playing with my Play-Doh with my sister, and we were having a good time. However, something about our house always felt off. Apparently, all six couples who had lived here previously were divorced, and the same had happened to my mom and dad. But we tried not to think about it too much and focused on our Play-Doh. Suddenly, my sister asked me to go downstairs and get a butter knife. I hesitated for a moment, but then made my way down the stairs. As I looked towards the kitchen, I saw a big, looming black shadow. I was frozen with fear and let out a scream before running back upstairs to my sister. She laughed it off and went to get the knife herself. I wasn't the only one who experienced something strange in that house. My brother once felt something like a hand touch him while he was sitting on the edge of his bed. He looked under the bed but saw nothing there. My mom also saw a shadowy figure next to her bed more than once. At first, she thought it was one of us kids, but when she realized she was alone in the house, she got scared. Despite trying to brush it off, the eerie feeling of the house persisted. Eventually, we decided to move out. The place still gives me the heebies, jeebies, and I can't help but wonder what was really going on in that house. Hunting a day after a snowfall, I stayed out until well after sunset. Took what looks like an old logging skid that cuts across a hillside like a trail, but sunk in enough that it's like a ditch you could drive through. The sides are icy and sparkling in my flashlight and my steps are super crunchy. That's it for that night, but I go back to the same spot the next day. Get set up at a natural saddle with many deer tracks and sit. There's clearly an animal trying to move quietly off one side of the ridge, so I'm very focused and dying to stand up and take a peek. Sun goes down. Coyote starts sounding off, and some dude starts screaming help. Then just plain screaming, from the same direction as the coyotes. And it's the same and only direction back to the road. I decided he's either having a freak out or getting torn apart. Either way, I'm waiting to see if it's a deer down there, as this is my last day of the season. Eventuality shooting light is over, and I decide I don't want to stumble into anything weird like an ambush or a crime in progress. Archery season so stupid, no gun rule. So I sit there for another hour to wait it out, and maybe kill a coyote. Eventually I'm frozen and dying to pee, so I quit, and after about an hour in the dark, I strike that same tunnel-like path. The instant I reach it, I can see in my flashlight that there's mountain lion tracks converging from the opposite direction and going right on top of my prints from yesterday. Mother effer, I can't say he was trailing me the day before, but they look the same exact age. 
Hair standing up big time. Okay, maybe I almost died yesterday, but I'm definitely fighting a giant cat tonight. Worst thing was the dead still air and my feet making so much noise that deep bass crunch, giant full moon light shining on the snow. World become black and white, very surreal. Story actually ends uneventfully, but strangely there was no sign of anyone else by the road. When I was 11, I was friends with this girl who lived alone with her mom in this massive old Victorian house. It was gorgeous. Wood floors, fireplaces in every room, and heavy doors with window, things at the top. She had told me her house was super haunted, but I figured she only thought that because of how old it was. So we're playing Barbies in her room. It's just her, one other girl, and me. Her mom is across the house sewing. They decide to go into the kitchen and make macaroni and cheese. I want to keep playing, so I stayed alone in her room. I watched them leave the room, and since the door was super heavy, I clearly heard it shut. The floors creaked as they walked into the kitchen. I could faintly hear them talking because the window thing was open above the door. To set the scene, I'm sitting on the floor with my back to the fireplace, doing my Barbie thing. On her mantle, she has like a dozen or so American girl dolls lined up all perfect. About ten minutes go by. I was still playing when I heard the door open. They were back from the kitchen. The girl who lives there immediately lays into me saying, That's not funny. You know I'm freaked out about the house and ghosts. I have no idea what they're talking about. Then I looked at the mantle. Every single one of the dolls' arms were in the air. They refused to believe I didn't do it and I still get goosebumps thinking about it. I grew up in rural Pennsylvania and have spent most of my life here. I've been hiking all over the state at least once a week every week since I began driving at 16. But all across the many state parks, I have spent thousands of hours hiking in the woods. I've had three strange encounters now since the summer of 2022, almost as if a door has been opened since the first one. The story I'm sharing today is the most recent thing that happened to me and my two buddies last Saturday night. It completely traumatized me. My two lifelong friends and I went on a spur of the moment night hike Saturday night. I haven't hiked at night for nearly two years. I used to hike alone all the time, but hiking with these two guys made us all feel bold. We were hiking near the part of the Appalachian Trail where we grew up in Duncan, and the AT runs through the town. There's a ridge next to the town with a very popular hiking vista called Hawk Rock. At the base of the mountain, there's a creek that flows into the Susquehanna River and a road that follows this creek back into the woods for about a mile and a half. It leads to Boy Scout camp shelters and water wells, follows the creek around a bend, and then ends where the road ends. We have a low-key camping site that follows an easy to miss trail that continues past the road and goes into the woods another couple hundred of yards. We're about two and a half miles from the car. We're sitting there talking about Sasquatch and encounters. Both of my friends have ever had an encounter. This night was totally dark with no moon. We couldn't see each other side by side without a flashlight, and it was dead quiet. In hindsight, it seems weird. There are normally lots of frogs along that creek. I've been at this campsite about two dozen times and never had anything happen to us there. We're talking about missing 411 and my two previous encounters. One friend has never heard the Sierra sounds, and my other friend told me not to play them. I made two tree knocks, then we played the Sierra sounds in total darkness. On cue, not even a minute went by, and a huge rock splashed into the creek about 30 yards away from the direction of our trail, and the only way out, I was already on my feet. I have thrown many rocks into creeks, rivers, and lakes, and that rock was large. It made that whoop sound of breaking the water and crashing into the creek bed. Immediately, we felt that sense of dread and danger. Then it happened a second and a third time back to back. I said we need to get the F out of here right now. We were 100% sober. I've been up and down that creek by kayak trail and fishing. 
It's one of the few areas in Pennsylvania that doesn't have beavers. I've never seen a beaver or signs of beavers anywhere along that creek. I've heard beaver tail slaps, and it didn't sound like that at all. It was loud and scared the crap out of us. It was so close to us that it didn't seem like just a coincidence. We packed our bags up at hammocks in less than a minute and started walking out in the direction of these splashes. We got parallel to where it happened, maybe 30 seconds later. The creek was five feet to our left. There was a fog over the creek. We couldn't see the other side, but there was nothing over there but woods. Then it happened a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth time. Loud splashes of large rocks crashed into the water right next to us. I was on point. We're going through this trail with the brush to our right and the creek to our left dark. We weren't speaking to each other. We stuck together and were only focused on getting out. We got back to the road and we were practically jogging back toward the car. We were saying that was weird and was too close and too conveniently timed. We continued down this road and got a mile away from where it happened. The road was maybe 50 feet from the creek now and a little bit higher up, but still parallel to the creek and completely silent, so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. We began to feel like we were okay now. But then it happened again. A large, loud splash in the creek below is perfectly parallel to us. The sense of danger was palpable and we could feel it around us. Something was on the other side of the creek mirroring us. The problem was there are no trails, no houses, nothing but woods over there. Whatever it was over there was keeping pace with us silently without light or without a trail, and we could feel it. We got to the end of the road and two kids were walking in with lights. We saw them coming. I said to my friends, we have to tell them what just happened. We couldn't let these kids go in there without warning. We told them what happened and all of us were clearly shaken and rattled. We got into the car and drove back to my buddy's place in town. For three hours we tried to rationalize and reason what it was. You couldn't think of any animal that checks all the boxes of the behavior. If it was somebody messing with us, they were in the middle of nowhere, without a light throwing large rocks and moving silently without a trail. If it was an animal, we would have heard it moving. If it was something in the water, we would have heard it displacing water while moving. I know this area like the back of my hand. I'm terrified to go back outside again and afraid it as soon as the sun goes down. We all felt like we were lucky to get out of there. I was excited about spring and summer and to get back out hiking again, but I am terrified at the thought of it. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a herpetologist. I travel frequently into the North Georgia mountains, up into the Helen area in the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest. On this day, I was going there to observe some wildlife that I frequently study. This was last September 2016. It was approximately 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening, and as I was going to my usual sites, and I observed that there was no wildlife active. I didn't notice it at first, but I did later on and as I was walking. I walked up to a ridge, and I noticed there was something diagonal from me. It was on the ground, and it wasn't moving. I was about 20 to 25 feet away from it. I moved towards it, and it jumped up and spun around very quickly. I realized, you know, this was something very out of the ordinary, something I hadn't seen before. And it was sitting there, and it was staring at me, and some minutes had passed, and at this point in time, it was making moans or growls. It was making sounds close to that. That's the best way I can describe it. It was man like it was approximately seven and a half to eight feet tall and four and a half feet from shoulder to shoulder. It was very large and bulky. Some might say it was eight. Like, but in my opinion, due to my studying various wildlife, it was not anything close to being an ape. It was like a man. There was absolutely nothing ape about it. Very muscular. The hands, the best I can describe, the hands are about a size 13 or 14 or maybe even larger as far as trying to fit a ring on it. Very muscular. I cannot stress this enough. You could see the whites of the eyes, unlike other creatures. They were squinted and aggressive. The forehead was not ape-like. It was more homo sapiens than ape. 
It did have full body hair except for the hands and feet. There was hair on the knees and elbows. It had hair like a man. The teeth. I was able to observe the teeth as they were bared most of the time. The teeth were like a man's. They did have three or four canines, but they were worn and pretty nasty. I stood in front of this creature for a significant amount of time. I didn't know whether to run or just stand there or do whatever you do. Definitely this creature could outrun me. Like I was saying, the hands and the skin were tanned. They weren't black. I wouldn't even say dark brown. They were just tanned. It did have fingernails. Human-like, they didn't have blood on them. I was able to tell that. This was all happening, and as I was observing its hands, he was sizing me up. That's the best way I can describe it then picked up a log. I was able to observe that. He was most likely right, handed. I know this is going to be hard to believe, but it's true, and it chucked it in my general direction. Notice I said him. It did have male sexual organs. I was able to observe that. No tail. It walked upright. It had brownish, reddish hair. It was matted. I'm not 100% sure if it was due to the Georgia clay or if that was his actual hair color. I was able to observe it was a mix of brown and red. After it chucked the log at this point in time, I started backing up slowly. It didn't charge me or try to beat me or anything like that I was expecting. I was slowly backing up. There was a strong stench and body odor, somewhat that of a wet dog, but I'd say probably a hundred times stronger. I was backing up, and this all happened within two minutes, and I slowly started backing up down the ridge, and eventually I got out of sight, and I made a beeline back to where I came from. It was definitely real, beyond a shadow of a doubt. It was what some might say was a Bigfoot Sasquatch or whatever. It was not a man. It was not a native creature that's seen every day. Someone might make their own decision about it. That's all I got to say. There wasn't much to compare it to, but about 400 pounds. The forehead was sunken back, and the shoulders were more forward. It didn't have a proper human posture. It was definitely leaning more forward than straight up. It's rare to see somebody that would be as muscular as that creature. It was exhibiting more caution, on the verge of aggression. The eyes. I was able to observe the eyes did have more downright fear but there was aggressiveness there. The eyes were squinted, the breathing was rapid, and going by the noises the creature was making, it was threatened. I have two stories. Hope I'm not too late to the party. I would like to preface this by saying I think my dog is my guardian angel. I was camping in Gloucester, Mississippi, on the Audubon's property when I was about six. We went with a group of entomologists, and they took up the whole main house, so we had to camp out in the forest. When we woke in the morning, my father left to go to the main house to get some breakfast. He left me in the tent with our dog and drove about four to five miles back. I was trying to go back to sleep when I was awoken to my dog growling and looking more freaked out than she had ever before. I heard something brushing itself up against the tent, going around and around. I grabbed my dog and pulled her into my sleeping bag as I quietly wept watching and listening as something was creeping around. As it began pushing against the tent harder and harder, I began to audibly sob, at which point I heard its terrible scream. It was a mountain lion. My dog kept growling and I kept crying for what seemed like hours. Finally, I heard my dad pull up in his old truck. I told him, and to this day, he does not believe me. He's one of those see-it-to-believe-it type of people. But my next story is something that started to make him believe. My dad used to take our dog with when he worked as a self-employed contractor in the uptown area of New Orleans. After work, he and my dog picked me up, so upon arriving to our house, it was approximately midnight. Our house is quite old and used to be owned by one of the members of the Marcelo family. The way the house is set up is the driveway is on the right side of the home. And as you go through the garage, it leads to our kitchen and then our dining room and living room and so forth. As soon as we unlocked the door, it was like we could feel it. Something was off and my dog could tell it too. 
She started growling and was tugging at her leash. My dad shouted out, asking if anyone was there. We approved the dining room, which held an old circular table that came with the house. The table had around eight heavy chairs around it. As we got closer, my dog was no longer trying to get at something, but instead putting away. I picked her up, and just as I did, one by one, all of the dining room chairs pulled back, and the lights flipped off. After a few seconds, the lights flipped back on, and I looked at my dad. We both had astonished looks on our faces. I knew, since it had startled him, it was really something strange and cried. I cannot give any logical explanation as to why that happened. My boyfriend and I were driving through the mountains in Colorado, close to Copper Mountain, actually. It was the middle of the day, and we were listening to music, but we're both silent. Through the windshield, I noticed a bright circular light hovering at the same elevation of the surrounding canyon walls, probably 12,000 feet, or approximately 3,000 feet above the highway. I watched it for 15, 20 seconds. All of a sudden, it shot up and disappeared from view. My boyfriend said that he looked over and saw my face, and knew I saw it too. I think both of our jaws dropped. Now, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that a UFO means we witnessed anything extraterrestrial, but we definitely saw an unidentified flying object. I mean, Cheyenne Mountain is only about two half hours away from this spot. This happened a few years back, maybe four or five on a summer night, sleeping in my room, windows closed in a rural mountain area, but with plenty of houses and people around. It was maybe a Saturday night, the party night in the city. A very clear girl scream woke me up. It was coming from the road, I assume, and about 50, 60 meters away from my house. She screamed three or four times, very loudly. Then I didn't hear anything else. Being a rural, quiet area that was creepy and clearly not something that would happen without some major event around it, I just assumed they were teenagers coming back from the club and maybe playing around, but I've got a nasty, creepy feeling that someone got canapped or worse right next to my house that night. It haunts me to this day that I never did anything, not even getting up and trying to look outside and maybe spot some car lights. I blame it on my sleepiness. Maybe the whole memory of it scares me to this day. Did not hear anything about it the next day, though. In 2008, my wife and I left California on a 40-feet sailboat intending to sail as far west as we could. We spent weeks at a time without contact with another human being. Shortwave radio was often our only link to civilization, and eventually we were too far south and west even for that. We passed New Caledonia and didn't know what to expect as we approached Australia in the third year of our tour. Of course, the Great Barrier Reef was on our charts, but we were sticking to shipping lanes to avoid grounding, so I was stunned when I took watch one calm morning and noticed a low, dark brown shape on the horizon. To the west and south, there seemed to be a massive sandbar or island that had risen out of nowhere. The sea was calm and the winds light, so we cranked the engine and motored the last mile to this uncharted barrier. As we got closer, it became clear that it fortunately wasn't above the surface, but it looked like a brown reef or bar or mass of logs that was only a few inches below the surface. But how could a reef so massive not exist on any chart? We swerved left and right, looking for channels or breaks in the bar, but our depth sounder stayed pegged, so we had nothing to guide us through. We had no way of asking anyone whether it was safe to proceed, so when the reef no longer had any gaps to aim for, we tentatively poked the bow into it with the engine in neutral. No grinding, no shudder. Just silence as the reef enveloped us, and our finicky depth sounder still stared back at us blankly, so I ran to the transom, intending to put on a mask and look below, but then I saw that it was just a brownish tint to the water, some chemical or brown oil. Wary that it was a dangerous chemical spill or weapons test gone wrong, 
I dipped a bottle into it and tried to sample it without getting any on my hands. We continued puttering through this ocean of brown for miles before it eventually dropped away behind us as abruptly as it had appeared. I went ashore with my sample and intended to ask customs agents about it. The other sailors at the dock were oblivious. They'd not seen anything like it on their passage, never in their years of sailing these waters. But luckily, a wizened old man at the dock set me straight before I went insane with conspiracy theories. Turns out we just caught the Great Barrier Reef in its annual orgy. The brown color to the water was the spore of the reef that it releases all at once across the entire continental shelf of Australia. In this year in Queensland, we had calm weather with little churning to dissipate the massive cloud of life. Years ago, when I was backpacking across Western Europe, I was just outside Barcelona hiking in the foothills of Mount Tibidabobo. I was at the end of this path, and I came to a clearing, and there was a lake very secluded, and there were tall trees all around. It was dead silent, gorgeous. And across the lake I saw a beautiful woman bathing herself, but she was crying. I hesitated, watching, struck by her beauty and also by how her presence, the delicate curve of her back, the dark sweep of her hair, the graceful length of her limbs, even her tears, added to the majesty of my surroundings. I felt my own tears burning behind my eyes, not in sympathy, but in appreciation of such a perfect moment. She spied me before I could compose myself, but she didn't cry out. Instead, our eyes held and she smiled and enigmatically, fresh tears still spilling down her cheeks. I was frozen. I knew nothing about this woman, and yet, as we stood on opposite sides of a pool of water, thousands of miles from my own home and everyone I had ever known, I felt the most intense connection, not just to her, but to the earth, the sky, the water between us, and also to the entirety of mankind as if she symbolized thousands of years of the human condition. I wanted to go to her, to comfort her, to probe this feeling of belonging I had never encountered before, but couldn't, because I knew that if I spoke, if she spoke, that moment would be ruined, and I knew I would need the memory of that moment to carry me through the inevitable dark patches throughout my life, and so I watched her lower her hand, turn and slowly walk to the shore opposite me. The rest of her perfect form was gradually revealed to me, and I held my breath as I watched her disappear behind a copse of trees near the water. I didn't follow her, in fact I turned around. I knew there was nothing else we could experience together that would be more perfect than that moment, and it still remains the most profound experience of my life. I used to work at a movie theater downtown. I usually would get off around 1 a.m. when the buses would have already stopped running, and on one such night, while I was crossing over one of the many bridges on foot, I decided to take a shortcut. I miscalculated because I was fairly new to the area and ended up under the bridge where there was a large homeless camp. Anyways, I was trying to see if I could salvage the shortcut as opposed to backtracking when I noticed that I was being followed. I'm a pretty nervous person, the type who is always looking over my shoulder when out walking at night. When I did, I saw someone less than 20 yards back under another small foot bridge, peering out behind a pylon. At first I just thought it was someone who didn't want to be seen or was paranoid, but I noticed that as I walked, I would see them making an effort to catch up to me. I immediately whipped out my cell phone to call my girlfriend just so that I could be on the phone with someone. No answer. As I was pretending that I was on the phone, I noticed that they had kind of back off and were now keeping a longer distance, maybe 30 yards or so. The shortcut came to a dead end with a highway on one side and the river on the other. I was going to have to backtrack and go right by the person. I turned around and postured up as well as got really loud on my fake phone call. I saw them go back to, to their pillar and kind of hang out behind it. As I approached the footbridge, I was staring right at the pillar, 
and could see the guy in the shadow looking right back at me. At about fifteen or so yards from the footbridge, I dead sprinted past him without stopping to look back for about a full minute. After getting back on the right course, I came across about five cop cars with police officers and key nine, all looking around in the homeless camp. One officer stopped me because I was still kind of power-walking looking disgruntled. He searched me and then said that there was someone with a knife that had just stabbed two people and was in the area. I told the officer what had just happened and then walked home and cracked a cold one. Last hunting season, I was running solo in the backcountry. The area I was in had burned in the 90s, so there were a lot of dead trees in the burn scar. The first night out there, I was woken up to a very loud but distant roaring sound around 2-3 a.m. Aside from the obvious reasons to be freaked out, there was a wildfire around 30 miles to the south of me burning its way north. At first, I thought the sound was one of the DC-10 fire tankers flying over as the sound was getting steadily louder. All of a sudden, there were extremely loud, booming noises that sounded like bombs going off, echoing up the canyon, and the roaring ramped up to almost deafening. It was a windstorm tearing through the canyon I was in. The explosion-like sounds were dead trees getting blown over. I heard a couple dozen trees crashing to the ground before the wind passed. I was sure the trees around me were going to be falling on top of me, even though they weren't dead. Didn't sleep for the rest of the night. One time I was solo camping and I had my first lucid dream. Nightmare that ended up not being lucid for a bunch of it. The reason I mention it was because it took place at the spot I was camping. In the dream, I woke up to people rustling and a voice speaking incredible lowly and slowly in Latin or something, and I immediately got up and unzipped my tent and saw nothing. And then quiet, and after like two minutes of sitting there, terrified, I opened and got out to see my family frozen, eyes wide open, staring behind me where I previously checked, and I turned around in the face of this grotesque horned demon which was these deep purple and black, and as soon as I made eye contact, I froze from fear with that feeling of adrenaline you get when that happens. And just with stick starting in this thing's eyes, and my family, and this one man, I didn't recognize silently, almost hovered next to me, all frozen, not able to control ourselves in this demon's gaze, and then without break eye contact, he pointed to my left and then in this bizarre, deep, and powerful, but quiet voice he told us to go to the house. So right spooky nightmare woke up in an insane sweat from a combination of craziest and most recent nightmare of my life and being in a sleeping bag. But what really kick it is, I almost forgot about the thing two hours later, had already had some jerky for breakfast, packed everything up, and wandered around with my pack enjoying this morning. Before I headed home, and not fifteen minutes later, I came across an abandoned house that had no reason, being where we were for so many reasons. And as I saw this abandoned house froze, staring at it, I managed to walk at it directly, not even at an off angle. I felt like the demon from my dreams might as well have been in that house staring at me. And after what seemed like ages, I ran in the opposite direction, past my sight and back where I originally came from, towards the nearest trail a mile or two away. I don't know how my unconscious mind would have known there was a house there to put it into my dream. I hope it was the most terrifying coincidence of my life. I have always wondered what would have happened if I went into that house. While camping, my then boyfriend and I decided to go on a night hike. We were near a large lake and knew that there was a really idyllic meadow somewhere along it. It had snowed recently, so everything was really pristine and quiet. Expecting a fairly tranquil experience, we both took a low dose acid. We knew it was, since we had done tabs from the same slip before, to get the full effect of the night sky. We opted not to use flashlights and just let our eyes acclimate to the dark. 
Things went well for a while. The lake was beautiful, reflecting a full moon with untouched soft snow or sand on the bank. However, as we left the banks to walk further into the forest for the aforementioned meadow, the mood sort of shifted. It may have just been the acid. It had already started to hit while we walked along the lake, but the quiet suddenly felt stifling and every sound or movement stood out a lot more. People in comments before me have mentioned a feeling of dread or being unwelcome, and I'd say I definitely experienced that. Since I was on acid, I figured the best thing to do was to just ignore it and be positive, lest I give in to a bad trip. But as we walked further, everything felt heavier around me, and all I wanted to do was stop and look around. Being the easily spooked and borderline superstitious person that I am, I somehow thought that I definitely should not look over my shoulder. I walked resolutely, keeping my eyes on my feet. When I started to hear footsteps that just barely didn't align with what I'd expect from an echo, they were coming from behind me and my boyfriend was ahead of me. All I could think to myself was, you're on acid. Just chill on a loop, but I could just feel something just beyond my line of sight. I told myself I was being paranoid and just kept staring at my feet. Finally, we reached the meadow and it was such a relief. We were literally out of the woods and back on the safe banks of the lake. We sat on a log or something and just caught our breath and enjoyed the moment. We were barely there for a couple minutes when this thick fog rolled from the forest and lake. It moved quickly with little tendrils of fog creeping ahead, curling around the rocks and flowers at our feet. Finally, I just gave in to my paranoia and told my boyfriend we needed to leave. Now, he hadn't been as spooked as I was and actually liked the fog, but agreed to go. As we left the meadow and got onto an established exit trail back to the campsite, I looked back at the lakeside and saw a dark shape in the fog standing at the banks. That's when I absolutely noped and jogged back with my phone light and a flashlight on in my hands. Two, this one is short. A palate cleanser, if you will, towards the beginning of that hike before the acid really hit and as we were walking along the banks, I started to hear snorting and cracking branches. I got spooked expecting a bear, unrealistic for the area, but I'd seen one while camping before, or some shit, and was ready to bail, had my lights on ready to scare some animal away, when this big-ass dog with a wagging tail and lolling tongue runs into the clearing my boyfriend and I were in. I immediately squealed in delight and opened my arms to the dog. It came at me, all licks and snuggles. A couple seconds after, about three more dogs run in, all different breeds. I'm in dog heaven. They're all friendly and cute, and, and it's killing me. We hear some short, loud whistles, and this big Santa-looking guy comes into the clearing, too. The dogs immediately heal, all relaxed. Turns out he lives off, grid nearby, and enjoys raising training dogs. They just finished their hike and were heading home in the opposite direction. The big adorable one was an Alaskan Malamut. The others were a German Shepherd, a pit bull, and a mixed terrier type, all deadly cute. When I was younger, my family and I would go to this tiny town in Missouri to visit my great-grandma. The town only had about 600 residents and was one of the bigger ones in the surrounding area. While down there, we decided to visit a family-owned farm, which was about 30 minutes away by car. My grandma, at the time, was very into photography, specifically rural abandoned houses. As we were driving towards the farm, we saw an old beaten-up house that my grandma wanted to take some photos of, so we took a small detour and drove up the gravel road to the house. Being kids, my cousins and I really wanted to go and explore the inside of the house, which we were allowed to do with the exception that we weren't allowed to go to the second floor, in fear that it would cave in. My cousins and I started exploring the house, which was even worse on the inside. In the living room, there was a huge hole in the ceiling due to collapsed rotting wood. There were mushrooms growing on the carpet in the staircase to the second floor had fallen down removing any hope of us sneaking up there. 
Just as we were about to leave, my cousins and I were interrupted by my aunt, who was angrily yelling at us to get outside. Apparently, she had seen one of us standing at the window on the second floor, which she had specifically told us not to go to. After explaining that the staircase had caved in and there was literally no way of us getting upstairs, she calmed down. I asked my aunt what the person looked like, and she described it as simply looking like a dark figure of a person which I know sounds pretty in, descriptive. She also said that she assumed it was just dark inside the house, and that's why she couldn't see any features, and that the person moved away from the window once she started yelling. I don't have any pictures of the house, but I know that my grandma was using that hipstamatic app and maybe posted them to Instagram. I'd have to check. I'm sharing a personal paranormal experience that still haunts me to this day and that I've been trying to understand for a while now. A few months ago, I was staying at my cousin's farmhouse in the countryside, where I had always felt an eerie feeling, but never really thought much of it. One summer night, while lying in bed, I heard slow and deliberate footsteps outside my door. I called out to my cousin, but there was no answer. Suddenly, the doorknob began to turn, but the doorknob began to turn, but the door remained locked. As I lay there paralyzed with fear, I saw a tall and shadowy figure with piercing red eyes through the crack in the door. The figure just stood there, staring at me for what felt like hours. Eventually it vanished, but I still felt a sense of dread wash over me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was still there with me. It took me several days to recover from the experience, and I still don't know what I saw that night. This encounter has left me with a newfound appreciation for the paranormal and a healthy respect for the unknown. That is why I'm posting my experience here, to those who have also experienced something similar to me. How are you feeling? Was your experience like mine? Two years ago, I was mushroom hunting in Klamath Falls, Oregon, and I was looking for my son, and I actually stood a little ways from a Bigfoot as he came down the hillside. The sound of his footsteps I'll never forget. He tried to break the branches off trees to get away from me, but I kept talking, and he was very interested in listening, but something spooked him, and he ran off. So I just got home, and it's dark outside, and I look up, and there's a light going across the sky, kind of slow, but also kind of fast, maybe, a little faster than an airplane. But it didn't have a blinking light on, and it was very bright. If I'm not mistaken, it's illegal to fly a plane without a blinking light on. And then I look, and there are five or six more light behind it, but they're not as bright, and they're going a little slower. Then out of nowhere, the bright one just disappears, and then so does a few of the dim ones. And then one of the dim ones stops and starts like shaking and going back and forth, and then they all just disappear. I thought maybe it was a military thing or maybe drones, but I don't think drones can be as bright as that one UFO I saw. What do you guys think it was? I used to live in the middle of nowhere. I would go on walks with my newborn to calm him down, day or night. We had a mile-long private road that ran along a national forest. There are very few, if any, dangerous type animals, so I, I felt relatively safe taking these walks. One night, my baby was very fussy, and so he was whining quite a bit, as fussy babies do. I put on my baby carrier, strapped him in, and off we went. This carrier allowed me to be hands-free on our walks, and he laid against my chest so he was comfortable and could still look around a bit. We were walking along in the dark with the flashlight off as the moon was bright when I heard noises in the woods. I soon realized we were being stalked, though the only animals that might behave that way in that area would be coyotes, and it's extremely rare they would attack an adult. I started talking loudly. Nothing important, just describing things around me in a tone that was loud but wouldn't scare my baby. 
I heard them shifting in the woods as I walked along, so I turned my flashlight to the woods, and sure enough, I saw a set of eyes glowing back at me. I can only assume they thought to see if they could get my baby. They must have recognized his noises as a much smaller creature they could take advantage of. We finished the walk without incident, though they continued to stalk us for quite a ways. I've run across coyotes many times, and they've not always shown fear, but they've never followed me like that before or since. There wasn't much I could do, either. If I ran, they might have attacked, and I'm not sure how many there were. And I was already on the way back, so continuing to walk while making my own loud noise seemed the thing to do. I often wonder how long they were there before I noticed. I think that's the most creepy thing about it for me. I took a gun each time after that, but I never saw or heard anything again. Went to college in South Georgia, and possibly the creepiest thing I came across was twofold. Some friends and I went camping in the woods a few miles outside of town and used a game trail we found to get to a decent clearing. On the way, we found what looked like an after-prom night party. Two broken couches, empty bottles, and some used condom. That wasn't super weird until we found what looked to be a few dozen empty shell casings and holes in said gotch. Fast forward eight hours and a good twenty men drive to another area, and we are settling in for the night eating some soup and cornbread. That's when we hear what sounded like a mix between a dog growling and a bobcat growl. We looked out into the trees and saw nothing for a solid minute. So we figure it was nothing and go back to eating. Until an hour later, when we hear it again, only closer, and when we start looking into the dark, my buddy pointed to a pair of green eyes staring right at us. Couldn't make out the shape other than it had to be on four legs. It stared at us for a bit, and then turned and moved away without a sound. We didn't want to trek the three miles back to the truck, so we stuck it out and hoped for the best. I was at my friend's house, who lived in a pretty rural area. It wasn't miles between houses or anything, but there was a lot of forest and land behind all the houses, and a good size of distance between houses. The closest house to his was across the street. His other neighbors were a good distance away, along a windy road. We would go through the woods frequently, exploring and just having fun. One day we were out for a few hours, and it was starting to get dark. We had hit up a bunch of places neither he or I had been to, and at that point it was time to head home. Unfortunately, the path we took got us into some more unfamiliar territory. We were walking down what had once been an old river or stream. That was tried up, and a giant tree fell onto it across it. We made our way around the tree and started to climb up when we heard gunshots. We chalked it up to someone hunting in the distance because it was definitely not close. But we started to hustle to get up the bank. It was getting much darker by this point, and we were tired. Then we heard more gunshots, and this time they were closer. Then dogs barking. I think those were scarier than the gunshots, honestly, especially since those were definitely getting closer and quickly. We started to book it as fast as we could through this unfamiliar area, listening to dogs catching up to us. I don't think the shots were going off anymore, thankfully, but we were not extremely far from the pursuing pups. Thankfully, we got to the road. It was dark and getting darker by the moment. We stopped run and just hiked up the road towards his house. It probably took us ten minutes to get home. It was obviously his neighbor, since we ended up on their property. But it was still creepy that someone was shooting at and sending their dogs after us. It was a quiet night in suburban Maryland, and I was settling in for a relaxing evening at home after a long day at work. As I lounged on the couch, flipping through channels, I suddenly heard the sound of glass shattering in the kitchen. My heart raced as I realized someone was breaking into my home. Before I could react, I felt a sharp pain in my neck and my vision blurred. I struggled to stay conscious, but my body betrayed me, and I slipped into darkness. 
When I awoke, I found myself lying on a cold, metallic surface in a dimly lit room. Panic surged through me as I realized I wasn't in my home anymore. I struggled to sit up, my head spinning, and that's when I saw him, Navy SEAL Tom. Tom was a tall, imposing figure with a chiseled jaw and piercing blue eyes. He was bound to a similar metallic surface, and despite his restraints, he appeared calm and collected. As our eyes met, he spoke in a hushed tone. Hey, stay calm. We've been abducted, but I have a plan to get us out of here. I tried to process his words as I looked around the room, seeing other terrified people restrained just like us. The thought of being abducted by aliens was horrifying, but Tom's presence and his confidence gave me a glimmer of hope. As we whispered to each other, Tom explained that he had been tracking these extraterrestrial beings for some time. They had been abducting humans for unknown reasons, and he had finally managed to get close enough to be taken with the hope of gathering intel and possibly putting an end to their nefarious activities. Tom revealed that he had a small, concealed blade hidden in his boot. With immense effort, he managed to free one of his hands and retrieve the blade. He swiftly cut through his restraints and moved to free me and the others in the room as we worked together to free the remaining captives. Tom instructed us to stay low and quiet, ready to follow his lead. He stealthily opened the door to the room and peered down the dimly lit corridor. The walls were lined with strange glowing symbols that seemed to pulsate with a life of their own. We followed Tom through the alien ship, our hearts pounding in our chests. The vessel was a labyrinth of twisting corridors and eerie chambers, but Tom navigated it with incredible skill. Eventually, we reached what appeared to be the ship's control room. Tom wasted no time in scanning the alien technology, quickly deciphering their language and controls. He discovered that the ship was programmed to return to Earth, and he set it on an immediate course back to our planet. As the ship hummed to life, Tom led us to the escape pods, explaining that it was too risky to remain on the vessel during re-entry. We all climbed into the pods, our hearts racing, and braced ourselves for the wild ride back to Earth. The escape pods jettisoned from the alien ship, hurtling through the atmosphere at breakneck speed. As we touched down, we were greeted by a team of military personnel who had been tracking the alien ship. They helped us from the pods, and we were quickly whisked away to a secure location for debriefing. I couldn't believe what had just happened. The nightmare of being abducted by aliens was over, and I owed my life to Navy SEAL Tom. He had risked everything to infiltrate the alien ship and save us, and I knew I would be forever grateful. In the aftermath, Tom continued his work, hunting down any remaining extraterrestrial threats. As for me, I returned to my quiet suburban life, forever changed by the experience. A fellow firefighter who moved to Anchorage that was a friend had a surprising encounter with his wife and his buddy. And his buddy's wife on two quads. They were on two ATVs and it was on Revilla Island, about 12 miles north of Ketchikan. It was the bottom of the Brown Mountain Road, and it was the scene of a pretty hair-raising encounter with what really seemed to have been an irate Sasquatch, which reportedly chased these two couples who were four-wheeling down Brown Mountain in August two years ago, that's August 2011, and I'll just call him Curtis. He's a personable 27-year-old Ketchikan outdoorsman. He's moved up to Anchorage now, and he worked here in retail and did EMT and firework firefighting in his off hours. He was able to give these details, which I corroborated with the other witnesses. In Curtis' words, basically, I'll just read my recording. On the evening of August 26, 2011, I was with my girlfriend and another couple on two four-wheelers. We were having an evening ride on the Brown Mountain Road to the top of the clear cut that's 3,000. That's up near, maybe 1,500 feet. We had parked our trucks around 8 p.m. at the paintball gravel quarry, halfway along the road that's still closer to sea level. Some miles away, and we rode our four-wheelers to Harriet Hunt Lake and all around the area before going up the Brown Mountain Road sometime around 11 p.m.
up to the top of the mountain for a while, then back down. It wasn't raining, and we had moonlight, so we just kept riding until 11.45 p.m., and then turned around to come back down. My friends were ahead of us, and we were just trying to see how far down the road we could coast in neutral. My girlfriend and I, who is his wife now, just passed the campsite by the bridge and creek near the bottom of the road when I thought I heard footsteps running down the road behind us, and then my girlfriend looked around and said something's chasing us. I kicked the quad into gear and accelerated over 40 miles per hour, but I could hear that it was still following us. It was fast, that's for sure. Well, he continued, it was just near the bottom of the road where Brown Mountain Road meets White River Road that I made a quick decision to slow down a bit, to be able to make the turn and touch the brake slightly and take a quick look behind us in the brake light to see what I could. It was only about 20 feet or so behind us, and I was kind of shocked that the thing was as tall as it was. It was not a bear, seven feet tall and heavily built. Here my machine does 60 at the top, and I pegged it after the corner, he said. I passed my friend on his machine. His machine does 70, and we raced the seven minutes back to the quarry to load up and leave quickly, you know. I just, at this point, I just want to add with tenor. The friend, he had no idea at this point what was going on. Only that Curtis and his fiancée or his girlfriend were tearing past him. On the way, I could hear our girlfriend's voice over the engines urging us to go faster. I pulled up just ten seconds behind him. Tanner weighs 260 pounds, and he was lifting his 300-pound machine onto the open bed of his truck by himself as soon as I pulled up. He was helping me. Well, while we were loading my four-wheeler onto my truck, our girlfriends had taken my small tactical flashlight, and they'd been shining it back down the road where we come and all around, and he said. I believe they were both talking about what we'd seen chasing us, and I heard the word Bigfoot. As they showed the light, I noticed three surprising things. First, he said, there was a big black bear in the paintball part of the quarry. The local paintball club uses it about 35 yards away, and there was another, this is quite remote, and there was another smaller bear less than 20 yards away. These are both black bears coming slowly out of the bush on our side of the road. That would have been close to a valley drop, off that goes down 500 feet at the edge of the drop, off to the valley in the east. At that moment, I was still trying to strap my quad onto the truck bed, and Tanner and our girlfriends were standing right beside me. They were scanning the beam back and forth when I heard some kind of gravel noise down the road, and the girls screamed. I looked in the direction of the beam, and I was really shocked to see a tall, heavy shape standing in the middle of the road about forty yards back the way we'd come. It was right on the road in front of a big waterfall area. It was exactly the size and shape of the thing that had chased us down Brown Mountain Road, about seven feet tall, but it would have had to have been running forty to forty-five miles an hour to have got to where we were loading. I measured it out myself later, you know, 3.5 miles. It was really, it all matched. Well, the data confirmed it. When the light hit it, it dropped to a football player's stance. It was kind of bobbing up and down with one hand on the road and the other on its knee. At that time, the smaller black bear behind us that had just come out of the bush turned around and took off back into the bush, over the edge like, I want to get out of here. Everything was happening all at once. As the girls turned for the truck, I could see the beam hit the big bear in the paintball area, and it was going crazy knocking barrels over and crashing into things trying to get away from us, or the big flipping thing. So Curtis summed it up, he said. The girls jumped in the trucks, and they were yelling at us to get in, and both Tanner and I started to drive off. In almost the same second, Tanner had to stop for ten seconds to throw his ramps in the back, and I looked back to see the thing. But there wasn't enough light, and I was focusing on getting out of there. We didn't stop at all. On the way back, my girlfriend and I talked about it. We both agreed that it had to have been a Bigfoot we saw. We talked with Tanner and his girlfriend back in Ketchikan, and they agreed. That was it, he told me. I'll be back there for deer hunting, and... I'll be carrying a camera, he said.
What happened to us may sound amazing, but those are the straight facts as best as I can describe them, he says. I've seen documentaries of Sasquatches on television, and you have to say that the creature observed there twice the evening of August 26 matched the general description of a Bigfoot. This story is from around five, six years ago when I was a teenager, but I still remember it clearly. For some context, this was a wooded area near my hometown in the United Kingdom that had established bike paths and people visited regularly, making it a decently known area, but still was large and had areas that no one would go to. It began when my friend and I cycled to the area to do some jumps and generally just ride around when we spotted a swing on top of a hill and decided we wanted to go up and use it. We did so and spent around an hour or two just talking and swinging and it began to get dark. My friend took off as he had to be back earlier than me and instead of leaving, I cycled around for a bit longer. I ended up cycling pretty deep into the woods until I was no longer on bike paths and instead barley visible dirt paths. I went up another pretty steep hill and this is when it happened. Below me, around 20 meters or so near the bottom of the hill, stood a man wearing a black leather gas mask, some kind of military looking jacket, and holding a long thick torch in his hand. The torch wasn't on and he was just crouching down in my direction towards the hill staring straight at the ground, and from what I could tell, he wasn't doing anything at all. But then he looked up at me. I couldn't make out if he was staring directly towards me, but the cold black voids of the mask's eye sockets terrified me. I immediately nearly shit myself and leapt onto my bike. As I did, I heard heavy, rough, fast breathing getting louder, and I rode as fast I could for about ten seconds before quickly looking back. He was stood still at the top of the hill no longer chasing, but just staring at me with the same cold black eyes. I never told anyone what happened, not even any of my friends. And still, now even driving past, that place sends a chill down my spine. I know it's not a particularly amazing story, but definitely scares me still. Before starting to tell you what happened and how I got into this situation, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. I'm 29 years old and live in Switzerland where I work as a cop. Basically, it's like 911. Someone calls, then dispatch sends us for all kind of interventions. Sometimes things you see in that job changes your perspectives of what's normal. You meet all kind of people and sometimes weird places too. But in general, my country is safe, and I almost never carry my gun home, unless I go training at the shooting range. Also, and because it's linked to my story, I love music and driving cars. It helps me clear my mind and makes me feel good. Some time ago, I met a club of car enthusiasts, and from time to time, we meet and do little road trips across the country. I'm also a very chill and calm person, and I always try to find a peaceful solution to anything, especially at work. I try to always see good in people and prefer talking to them. Okay, here starts my story. Last year, 2022, I went on a road trip with a nice guy. I met through the car club. Let's call him Robert to keep anonymity. That trip was really cool, and we drove almost all night felt like playing ing fs which was great because the lights of cities looked beautiful at that time and i'm more of a night owl after that trip we said we'll stay in touch to make another trip someday weeks passed when suddenly i got a message on whatsapp hi it's been a while how are you still up for a little trip tell me when you're free when i saw the message i directly checked my schedule and found a free day i sent him back hey yeah sure I'm free on. Let me know if it works for you, too, he answers. Okay, works for me, too. Where do you want to hike? Then I was confused. Why is he talking about hiking? I checked again the message and noticed it was written by another Robert, too. From my contacts, not only did I mistaken the dudes by their names, but also because their profile pictures on WhatsApp looked alike. 
The guy that contacted me was an old acquaintance I met through some of my friends when I did some DJ set parties. It was a few years ago, and we were both passionated by the same music. Then from time to time, we bumped through each other at concerts. So I had just planned a day with this guy I mistaken for someone else. I felt bad and didn't want to cancel because although it wasn't the person I thought, that guy was nice too and it's been a while since I went for a hike in the woods or the mountains. So I was like, yeah, why the hell not? Then we started planning the hike. I didn't want something too challenging so I made a proposition. I knew a nice hike that goes through the woods and mountains. The views are beautiful and you get to meet hikers here and there. Also, the path has multiple campfire spots where you can grill some sausages. Robert, too, agreed and asked me if it's okay for me to take him at the train station and we'll leave my car at the parking next to Woods. The day of the hike, I arrived at the train station where Robert, too, was waiting for me. I looked through the place and couldn't find him. Then he waved at me. Here I got my first red flag. The guy I knew and saw in his profile picture looked different. It was Robert, too, but he looked sloppy. He grew long hair and had a beard. I charged up his bag in my trunk and we moved. During the ride, I noticed that Robert, too, smelled bad. It's the kind of odor I smell on the job when I'm confronted with homeless people or drug addicts. But I noticed he came well equipped for the hike, which means he wasn't in a no-money situation. So I decided to not judge him because of his body odor and to ignore it. Besides, we'll be in the woods so outside I wouldn't notice that. We stopped at a shop near the woods to get some fire starters, and that's when Robert asked me if I was up to change the hike because he knew another location close to the one I have chosen, and that had some nice spots for pictures. We both carried good cameras. I'm good with a map, and I checked it on my special app. The hike was the same length as mine, but it went near a river, which I found really nice. Okay, let's go check that. Finally, we parked my car and arrived at the forest. I saw some old barns there and little fields for cows. Our little trip started. During the hike, I was questioning Robert on his life to catch up time. I already knew he was a smart guy who did engineering school, but I learned he moved up from our city and found some job at a construction company where he does all kind of calculus to build stuff. Then the more I learned about his life, the more I felt something was odd. Robert started telling me he has a girlfriend, but they are going through some hard times and he thought she might leave him soon. Then he continued saying that he missed some days at work because he felt depressed and because he, he wasn't sure it pleased him anymore. He said he might get fired. I was trying to cheer him up and keep him focused on good stuff and advised him to consult if necessary. He asked me about my job and how I react with dangerous people and stuff like that. I wasn't reassured by all this conversation, but I always get all kind of questions from people, so I can't tell I was shocked. Also, during the walk, he sometimes looked a bit off, like a robot. At some point near the river, we found what looked like ruins from an old mild around 1920-1880, I'd say so. It was a cool spot, and I took a pick or two. But we didn't see any people on our path, and the sky got cloudy, and it started to rain a bit. Luckily, I was well equipped. I carried everything you need in this kind of places. Water, food, fire starters, first aid, and a knife. We kept moving until we found a campfire spot with a wooden table. We decided to stay there and eat. I asked Robert to get some wood while I'll set up the table and look for little branches to maintain the fire. Robert puts his bag on the table and starts to show me tools he got with him. He grabs a big handsaw, puts it on the table. Then he takes out two knives. One of them was a really big one. Switzerland's law is permissive regarding knives, in my opinion. I was surprised to see this kind of knife because it's a three hours hike and we're not staying there for the night, nor hunting something. So I decided to pull out the knife out of the knife holster I had attached on my belt to go get the branches. Robert looked at me and then he said something in a surprised tone that froze me to the bones. Oh, you took a knife too. Immediately my mind started racing. Two, what does this mean? Why wasn't I supposed to get a knife when we planned to go into the woods and make a campfire? 
Robert suddenly leaves to get what I ask him, and I got an uneasy feeling. It's like my whole body was in alert mode, saying me something is going on. I'm used to be around dangerous people at the job, but it's different when you're working fully equipped bulletproof vest, gun, paper spray, and you're with your partner in the situation I was in right now. I mean, we were alone in the woods and we didn't see anyone on the path. From that moment, I decided to keep both my eyes on Robert and keep him in sight all the time, especially his hands. That's what you learn at the police academy. People always use their hands to do harm. Moreover, I decided to keep a minimum distance in case he tries to do something. A few minutes later, Robert comes back, puts all the branches he grabbed from trees, his knife still in his hand. He looks straight at me and just stands there. Suddenly, he said, I'm sorry. His tone felt empty of emotions. Immediately, I got up and looked at him. I was sure he was going to run at me and try something bad. I got a rush of adrenaline. Then he started to mumble something I could barely understand. We're both here in the woods, alone. We got knives. I'm sorry. What does he mean? Why does he act that weird? Then Robert continues. Let's hug. My body gave me even more alerts. Why does he want to get close to me while he is holding a knife in his hand? Is he trying to do something bad? Why would I hug him out of nowhere? Then my mind told me I've got to get out of this situation quickly, but without making him suspicious. I wanted to leave this place and go home. I finally replied like nothing happened. No worries, man. Let's make that fire. Eat something so we can get home before going completely wet. But I didn't want to get close to Robert. I asked him to get more branches because the ones he got me were wet. I took the rain as my opportunity. After he came back, I told him the fire starters didn't work well in the rain and it might be a better option to pack our stuff and head back to the parking. He first looked skeptical and disappointed, but agreed. We packed everything and left the place. I didn't want to talk to him on our way back, but I didn't want him to notice something was odd, so I just kept talking like nothing happened. From that moment, his tone changed a bit, seemed colder to me. I kept him in my sight. After all, we were still alone in the woods. He kept being very negative towards life and people. It made me think he maybe was in some way. I was happy I did not carry my gun that day because I was afraid he might try to do something because of that. Once we got back to the parking where I finally saw people, he asked me if I could give him a ride. I refused arguing. I just got an urgent call from someone and needed to leave. After all that, I kept asking myself, was he trying to do something? Was he just afraid by the situation? Maybe it was odd for him, even though we knew each other and even partied together. Was he planning something? I mean, we were alone, in a place he knew better than me, and he was a really smart guy. All I can tell you is that I blocked him after that and decided to contact our common friend. I knew he was close to Robert, so I explained him the whole situation. My friend told me that Robert was going through some depression and was feeling bad lately. I told him that I can't do anything legally to help him without his consent, but I advised my friend to call him and make him see someone. A few weeks after my friend had a discussion with Robert, and apparently Robert was open to see someone about his problems. Thank you for reading my story. Let me know what you think about all this. I'm still confused to this day. I might be making my mind up, but I saw many people with similar reactions to Robert, and I'm not reassured about this. Two of my friends snuck out last summer and took a walk, listening to music. They decided to sit down on the road and talked a bit, and they both heard a distant scream that sounded pretty similar to an elk screech, but for like one second in duration. So they turned off the music and saw a huge humanoid horse. Looking things sprint out of this forest into a field, and they said it was running really fast, like 40 miles per hour. They said it was kind of hunched and had a limp, was lean but muscular, and was completely pale gray and naked. They both sprinted home and Facebooked each other when they got home and told me and a few others about it the next day. I was in disbelief, so I snuck out on my bike the next night with my other friend and met up with the two original people along with some others and went looking for it. 
We heard the noises they described, and I and my one friend saw a pale Bigfoot-looking creature walk in front of someone's barn light, like 300 yards away, but we're not sure. We continued to do this for a few nights, and one of them was walking to meet up with us alone to go looking for it, and had seen it like five times on the walk there, sometimes like 20 feet in front of him. We probably all went looking for it six or seven times in total. The last time we went looking, we all saw it, and it was super tall, like eight, ten feet, super fast, and had these glowing eyes you could see from a mile away. I'm pretty sure I also saw it have these long, greasy, locked strands of hair about shoulder length. It looked like a mix between a crawler, Aaron Yager Titan form, and Jeff the Killer. It was creepy. Then it was on the pavement. You could hear clopping noises like it had hooves or something. Aside from this, I was on a late-night gas station walk later that summer with two of my friends at three in the morning. On our way back, we saw something run hobble across the road about 70 yards in front of us, and it looked pretty similar. However, it was much smaller, maybe five feet tall, but I could see it being maybe seven feet if it was standing fully upright. This was in rural northeast Ohio. I forgot to add that we were walking on the way back to my friend's house one of the nights and behind somebody's house. We heard the noise of a baby crying in the woods. I couldn't have been mistaken for anything else but a baby. As soon as you bat an eye at that thing, he went zoom. You had to be looking in the right place at the right time. Half the people would see it and be like, oh, there he is. The other half would look over and he'd be gone. I don't think he was a crawler, since those are slow. This dude was super quick. My first thought when I heard my friend explain it was Wendigo. It could have been, not sure. I've seen its full body a few times, and the first time it was sprinting like 60 miles per hour in a field propelling itself with its front legs, and its back legs were really short and limp like Rex arms. I don't believe it was hairy, but I do recall seeing some long, greasy locks about shoulder length. There's a movie I remember seeing on Netflix called Sorry to Bother You, and in the movie, there are these tall, green-looking humanoids with horse heads who used to be people but took a drug, and it turned them into horse people. Look it up. It looked similar, mixed with a crawler and about 10 or 15 feet tall standing. I remember seeing it next to a ranch house, and it was easily taller than the house. I would describe the way it runs as somewhat like a chicken. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.